America in Another World, by Ron the Black Cat, Chapter 51, Blunderwaff, 0219 April 9, 2020 CE, 0409 Sun 9, 196 AE, somewhere in the Magus Imperium. Okay, move along, keep walking. Simon was in a line with a few other elves. The humans haven't been treating him too badly. After being captured, he had been put into some sort of truck along with another group of elven soldiers. The elven soldiers were infantry who got left behind during the retreat to the position that they were supposed to regroup. He could probably be counted among them since he was in a similar situation even though he was a lone sniper. They were in a city and there were quite a few human spectators watching them like zoo animals. He didn't look too much different than them other than the ears. The humans seemed to have transported them somewhere deeper in human territory. The place that he was entering seemed to be a large prison for all the elf pows. Magasian airfield modernized by the U.S. Two U.S. Army military intelligence agents watched as soldiers dragged the elves into the plane. One of the agents looked at the other who was his superior. Why are we sending these elves to the U.S.? CIA. What about the CIA? Being the annoying bastards they are. They didn't want to do interrogations here because of the lack of infrastructure. Lack of infrastructure. They can't do their quote-unquote fancy stuff here. Well, I hope they like the trip. His superior started laughing. The elves were blindfolded and gagged. Their hands were tied tightly with a piece of cloth to prevent them from using any funny magic. Whenever the elves were captured, some of them always tried to use magic to resist. Of course, the end result was them getting shot to pieces. That usually ended almost all forms of resistance but there were rare cases of idiots trying to commit suicide by armed US soldiers since they were too stubborn to surrender. The elves that were being sent away were the most uncooperative so military intelligence didn't mind handing them over to the CIA. 0232 April 9, 2020 CE. 0416 Sun 9, 196 AE. Elven Frontline. The surviving elven infantry and Magipanzers started to flee in fear as they saw what happened to their brethren closer to the front. Even more fearsome than the direct explosions of the human artillery were the unexplainable shrapnel explosions. An explosion would occur in the air and the infantry and Magipanzers below would all be mercilessly cut down by a rain of metal. A few minutes later, American Frontline, with his company was in a line formation, Captain John Rose's Abrams burst out of town, spearheading the entire battalion's counteroffensive. Behind them, Isaac was back in his squad's Bradley. Oh boy, here we go again. Isaac was clearly unhappy about the fact that he had to sit in a cramped and dim compartment for another hour or so without AC. The enemy resistance seemed to have instantly melted from the concentrated artillery fire. On their way towards the elven concentrated positions or what used to be their concentrated positions, elven tanks filled with holes and flesh littered the field. When they had arrived, the only things that remained of the elven positions were burning wrecks and dead bodies. Even further forward were the obliterated remains of the elven artillery. Isaac walked out of his squad's Bradley. They had been ordered to check for any survivors. Well, the artillery cleared the way. Doubt anybody can even survive this. Guess we don't have to do anything. 0245 April 9, 2020 CE. 0422 Sun 9, 196 AE. Elven Command Post. Colonel General Iro Anfaexalim contemplated what to do next. The humans had completely destroyed his offensive and battered his defenses. The human artillery was deadly. Not only had they demolished a large portion of his artillery, but the human rocket artillery also saturated his offensive units. According to the reports, it was horrifying. Something that could only be described as a rain of steel that cut down everything and anything. Those that were in its area of effect didn't even know what had hit them. He stared at the map and looked at a small wooden block that was off to the side. He still had an ace up his sleeve. Get the special Magipanzer Battalion. We will attack them before they can move up their artillery. Behind the elven front line. Era looked at the Magipanzers that rumbled by. They were much bigger than her knight. 
So these are the new Magi Panzers. One of her crew members was leaning against the knight. Yap, how effective do you think they will be, Commander? Era stayed silent. We will blow a hole through their lines. After his command, Major Hagluin Norris's 45 Fortress IIS spread out across the field in two wedges. Behind them, medium and light Magi Panzers followed. Further behind were the infantry, American slash Magus front line. Unlike the Americans who had armored vehicles, the Magus lacked the speed or protection. They were extremely exposed in the plains. There was no cover to be seen anywhere. They had just arrived at their designated positions and had barely any time to set up defenses before they were attacked. Where are our Magi tanks? Explosions occurred around the soldier. He ducked onto the ground with his hands on his helmet. Machine guns from the approaching elven magi tanks gunned down a couple of the still-standing Magusians. Get there as fast as possible. It's questionable if the Magus can hold them off and we have no artillery support to help them. John looked at his map. There were markings that indicate where each of the Magusian division was. Quickly finding the 27th, he replied. He got his armored company together. We are being sent to help them. After a short journey in column formation, they found their target. Elf tanks up ahead, let them rip. The elves were assaulting and clearly pushing back the Magusians. John's Abrams destroyed the knight closest to their position. Shots from his company followed. They quickly spread out and changed into a line formation in order to maximize firepower. The elves' wedge formation had been flanked. In his fortress too, Major Norrises noticed this and started to redirect his battalion. He understood that the enemy Magi Panzers were much more dangerous than the squashable infantry in front of him. The fortress IIS started turning to face the Americans. A shot from a turning fortress too bounced off of John's Abrams. The shot was returned in kind. The Saba round went straight into the fortress too from the front and it stopped moving. Under Officer Farron's Magi Panzer was taken out. His Magi Panzer stopped moving after being hit. In the name of the goddess, Major Norris couldn't believe it. Their new Magi Panzers were worthless against the American ones. His superiors had told him that the front armor of this new Magi Panzer was supposedly impenetrable by almost any gun in the Elven arsenal. Yet the Americans destroyed it as if the armor didn't even exist. Pummel them. The fortress IIS were not fast tanks because of their armor, they were meant to soak in damage while returning deadly fire. They were not suited for any flanking maneuvers on the battlefield when directly facing the enemy. The fortress IIS were now failing at their jobs. They couldn't soak in any damage from the Abrams and their fire were turned into ricochets and explosions that seemed to do no damage. Other than receiving scratch marks and minor damages to a couple of exposed parts on their tanks, John's company was completely fine. 14 M1A2 Abrams destroyed 45 Fortress IIS. The newest Elven Magi Panzer, which was proclaimed to be impenetrable from the front. Elven Command Post. What? What? What do you mean they were all destroyed? Um sir, from the um survivors. The Americans showed up with their Magi Panzers and completely destroyed the first special heavy Magi Panzer battalion. Are you telling me that these Americans were able to destroy a Magi Panzer that had more than 60 mm of front armor than the fortress? The messenger cowered at his commander's shouting and anger. Um, yes sir. Then how about the casualties on the American side? The fortress IIS were armed with a much better gun than the fortress. At least tell me that they took out a few of theirs. Ahm, um, from the observers of the battle, none sir, we did do damage against the Imperials though. None, none. He started laughing. He then reached for the pistol in his holster. A few seconds later, a shot rang out of the tent. Um, sir. The messenger stood bewildered at his commander's dead body. Silence filled the tent. Suddenly two guards rushed in. What happened? We heard a gunshot. The commander's dead. Ah, he shot himself. That was as clear as day since the messenger had no weapons on him. 0425 April 9, 2020 CE. 0512 Sun 9, 196 AE. Afavalin, Elven Nation. 
The first special heavy Magipanzer battalion was destroyed. Colonel General Faex Alim also committed suicide. Terran slammed his fist on the table in anger. He put his palm to his head and looked down. I'm ordering a full retreat to the Verona. Tell them to destroy anything of value during their retreat. All units will set up defensive positions once they arrive on the other side of the Verona. Destroy all bridges and prevent the enemy from getting through. After further instructing his generals, he got his coat and left. Terran entered Zenonura's office in the advancement department. He really disliked visiting this place. The curtains were almost always closed unless it was raining. It was as if Zeno was allergic to the sun. He always acted extremely gloomy when he had to go out in the sun. How are those Hexenbisons coming along? Very good my leader. We have started production and they will be capable of being fired upon the Empire very soon. How about the jets? Can we deploy them now? Ah, we are still doing some tests. Are those tests required? Well they are just making sure that. Good, we will be shipping them out to the field. We need them right now. Hmm. Well, I suppose I could rush the tests. 0907 April 9, 2020 CE. 0744 Sun 9, 196 AE. American Frontline. Seems like the elves are giving ground. They had been on the road for a few hours and there had not been a single enemy soldier in sight. Whatever towns they came across were burning. Elf positions seemed to have been abandoned and destroyed in a hurry. 1433 April 9, 2020 CE. Adelphi Laboratory Center, Aberdeen Proving Ground, United States of America. Scientists studied the destroyed remains of the elven weaponry that had just recently arrived. These magic batteries could be very useful. I'm going to need one that is less damaged to actually see how they work. From the information we received, the elves need to transition energy from themselves into the battery. And from our earlier tests, Americans can't use said magic because we are not native to this world. We are probably missing something that the humans of this world developed. Well, actually, an interesting thing that I overheard was that it is possible that humans evolved from elves or that elves evolved from humans. According to what was said, the elves' physical appearance to humans are almost exactly the same other than their pointy ears. Hmm. We will need to conduct further studies of their DNA about that. However, back to this, it's highly possible that we can improve these batteries so that they can directly siphon mana from the air. This could be a new source of renewable energy. Chapter 52, Full Retreat. 2222 April 9, 2020 CE. 0211 Sun 10th, 196 AE. Frontline. The entire elven army was on the run. U.S. Brigade combat teams made rapid advances throughout the night and reclaimed the Magasian lands that the elves ran from. The Magasian army couldn't keep up with the speed of the American advance. It was clear that the elves were starting to use scorched earth tactics. Every single house, town, and city that the American forces came across had been mostly razed to the ground. The scorched earth tactics had no effect on the U.S. forces. Of course, it caused a lot of anguish to the Magus. It was certain that the Magus wasn't going to like this one bit. Fifty miles behind them, the airfields were nearly finished with their modifications. The runways had been smoothed out and cleared and all needed facilities to operate American aircraft had been set up. Air support had finally come back online. With the U.S. Army getting ever closer to the elven airbases, they had begun to be within the range of elven aircraft. Because of the dominance of American airpower in the old world, the U.S. did not have a large arsenal of capable air defense systems. What they did have were shoulder-fired FIM-92 stingers which were meant for short-range anti-air. There were also versions that were mounted on Humvees and LAV-25S. Unslash TWQ-1 Avenger air defense systems were basically Humvees with eight stingers attached and LAV-ADS were the same as the Avengers but were LAV-25S that also had a 25mm gun with anti-air capabilities. The other system was MIM-104 Patriots which had medium and long-range anti-air and anti-missile capabilities. 
A Patriot battalion which consisted of six batteries had been spread out and deployed miles behind the front lines but were not expected to be used unless things got really problematic. A single Patriot missile was just too expensive to be wasted on a propeller aircraft. The sirens of multiple diving elven dive bombers could be heard. Although quite effective as a psychological weapon against the Magus, it didn't faze the US soldiers at all and was more of a detriment to the elves since it gave their position away. The Avengers quickly found their diving, screeching targets and fired. 16 missiles from two Avengers flew at mock speeds toward their targets. When elven dive bombers start to dive down, they would quickly be within the range of the FIM-92 stingers which could easily shoot them down before they could even drop their payload. Within only a few minutes after they were heard, the entire squadron of elven dive bombers had been shot out of the sky, missiles reducing their aircraft to mere fireballs. Somewhere in the elven nation, an elven officer in a sleek grey uniform sat comfortably in a chair behind a desk and stared at the human standing in front of him. The human was tall and had some muscle to him. The officer looked back down at the clipboard in his hand. In a crisp loud voice, he shouted, Laborer, next. The elven officer flipped to the next page. A boy who was 14 years old according to the information provided on the sheet of paper on the clipboard stared at him with a face full of anxiousness. The elven officer cocked his eyes. Servant. Next. A young girl came up. Servant. Next. A young woman approached the table. The officer looked up at her face and then down at her assets. His eyes looked down on her file and wandered back up towards her assets. He stared at them for a few seconds. Special work. Next. Unlike some of his colleagues, he was less inclined to say what special work was directly. This was one of the few camps that were organizing the captured humans. Laborers were mostly sent to factories. Servants and a few laborers were sold on the market to citizens by the government. The special works went to the brothels. Rather than killing all the humans, the elves believed that they had the compassion and mercy of letting some of them live to serve elves. They were basically slaves. 0220 April 10, 2020 CE. 0410 Sun 10, 196 AE. A sector of the Verona River. The sun was starting to set. Move, move, get everything across the bridge as soon as possible. An engineer came running towards him from the bridge. Sir, sir. The lieutenant general turned to face him. Are the charges set? Yes, sir. The lieutenant general nodded and glanced at his adjutant. How much more are coming across? This is the last division. Tell them to get a move on. We don't have time. The lieutenant general then went to find his executive officer. The executive officer was in the midst of ordering his division. He called out to his executive officer. How are the defensive positions? Machine gun nests are being set up across the river line. Mortars are ready to assault anything that tries to come across. All units should be positioned. We have every type of gun trained on this river, they are not passing through. A few minutes later, explosions rocked the sides of the bridges. It all came crashing down into the river. One of the many bridges that led across the Verona was blown up. More were to follow. American HQ. The elves have blown up every single bridge on the Verona River. They are setting up defenses on the bank. From the reconnaissance drones, I can see a whole array of machine gun nests, anti-air emplacements, artillery positions, and a heck ton of ground units. They are adamant on not letting us through. Shouldn't be that hard of a nut to crack. Miles behind the American front line. Fire. M777S and M270S thundered in the plains. The crews of the M777S fired for hours on end. The M270S went back for constant reloads of their rocket launchers. Overhead, formations of F-15ES rocketed through the skies. Once they arrived at the river banks, they swooped in low to drop bombs onto the elven defenses on the shore. Whatever the elves had put into that river line was pounded for hours to oblivion. Nothing but blackened dirt and mangled metal remained. Detecting these aircraft, 
Elves scrambled to get their fighters in the air but the end results of their air battles would never change. Every single time, their formations would be blown out of the skies by hundreds of missiles from F-16S. 0307 April 10, 2020 CE. 0445 Sun 10, 196 AE. A sector of the Verona River. Numerous HEMTTs, heavy expanded mobility tactical trucks, came up right beside the river. The trucks that were carrying small tug-like boats backed up into the water. Bridge erection boats were deployed from the back of them. After the boats were deployed, a few other trucks backed up into the river. They were carrying a different cargo. Improved ribbon bridges slid off of them and into the river. The once big cylindrical tubes that were on the back of the trucks slowly came apart into a flat floating bridge on the river. Like tugs, the bridge erection boats started guiding the improved ribbon bridges. They were soon all snapped together to form a large bridge that could cross the Verona. The first Abrams rolled onto the bridge. In the darkness, two elven scouts stared in amazement. The moonlight and the light from the American equipment gave a perfect view of what was happening. They are sliding bridges into the river. What? They stared at the scene through their binoculars. They were hiding in one of the few remaining bushes left after the relentless bombardment. They watched as a human Magi Panzer started moving towards the quickly made bridge. Isn't that thing too heavy? A few seconds later, the human Magi Panzer moved onto the bridge and it held up. Even more human Magi Panzers followed and piled onto the bridge. No way. One of the elves slapped his partner's shoulder. We have to go. Their Magi Panzers are crossing. We have to get this information back. They are doing it much faster than we are expecting. 1205 April 10, 2020 CE. 0603 Sun 10, 196 AE. Cat Kingdom, United Beastman Kingdom, so in a continent. Miller knocked on the door and entered. Wasn't our supply of extra rations and equipment supposed to get here today? We haven't received it yet. Wolfred looked up from his book. Ah, forgot to tell you. The ship carrying that stuff over got sunk. We got a second one coming. We should have it by tomorrow. Cutting it close but there's nothing we can do. Huh? Sunk? By who? The Elven Navy. No. According to the Coast Guard, it was attacked by some water creature. Large holes on the bottom of the ship or something. Hmm. Scary. Wolfred shrugged. Not an isolated incident either. There had been reports here and there. Pretty sure people are calling whatever is attacking, the Kraken. Funny thing is, they aren't even sure if it's a massive squid. Ha! Huh. Is the government doing anything about it? From what I have heard, not much, too focused on fighting the elves as of right now. Guess there's not enough damage to justify a dedicated response or something but the Coast Guard is investigating. Shouldn't be too surprising. Probably something similar to those giant birds in the new frontier. Well, new world, new creatures. Look around us. Wolfred looked back down at his book. Somewhere in the kingdom of Albia, swords clanged on the battlefield. Armor glinted from the sun. Dead bodies littered the ground. With his binoculars, an elf observed the battle from a cliff. He had a frown on his face. Damn beastmen. Should we prepare an armored assault now sir? He shook his head. Too many casualties. He knew how fearless the beastmen were. There had been multiple reports of them charging tanks and placing bombs on them. A lot of armored units had been disabled by that. Turns out quite a lot of the beastmen could take multiple hits from machine gun fire and not go down. They were also masters at assassination and infiltration. An entire armored column had been mysteriously blown up one night. Originally the elven invasion force was split between 70% going to attack the empire and 30% to the kingdoms. However, with the constant failures occurring at the empire, resources and units were diverted. It was now split between 85% empire and 15% kingdoms. With such few units, mounting a full offensive was just not possible anymore. Furthermore, with mounting losses from the beastmen's infiltrations, the elves could only form a defensive position. However, they knew that with their allied human kingdom mobilized, 
it will only be a matter of time before it shifts in their favor. A human knight was battered aside by a bear beastman who towered over all the humans. A cheetah beastman raced across the battlefield and cut down the humans who couldn't react to his speed. 0822 April 10, 2020 CE. 0744 Sun 10, 196 AE. The ocean between the Magus Imperium and Elven Nation. Another one sunk. The submarines had been constantly attacking elven ships that had been trying to cross the ocean towards the Magus Imperium. After destroying the last of the ships in that convoy, they quickly started moving away. Staying in one place was a death wish even with a modern submarine. It won't be long before elven destroyers and submarines started swarming the entire surrounding area dropping depth charges and randomly firing torpedoes. Chapter 53 Unraveled Chain of Command. 0812 April 11, 2020 CE. 0706 Sun 11, 196 AE. Of Valen, Elven Nation. Leader's Mansion. We can't hold on much longer. Our ships are being disrupted by American submarines and American ground forces are crossing the Verona with ease using their deployable bridges. Terran wrapped his fingers on the desk. His face was unreadable but clearly heavy. Terran knew that he had to act now. Former Admiral Adurm Vainery was standing in Terran's office with surprise clear on his face. He was literally dragged out of his retirement and given a ridiculous task. He was much more talkative now that he was no longer an admiral. But my leader, this is a suicide mission? Besides, I already quit. If this country is gone, then you are dead either way. We can still do some damage and maybe bring them to the negotiating table. I didn't even give you permission to quit. But I gave you my letter of resignation. Terran shook his head. I denied it. You can do that? Then why was I allowed to leave in the first place? I gave you a vacation. I wasn't informed about this. Doesn't matter, you are still an admiral of the National Navy, the last time I checked. I can still order you around. You are going to take this fleet and do as much damage as possible. You have a day to prepare. American submarine activities have been increasing. The time frame is narrowing. Why do you think I won't just defect once my fleet sails? If you do, you will either die by the hands of the naval officers loyal to me or die by the hands of those Americans. I can promise you that those Americans won't show mercy. We've been slaughtering and enslaving their kind. 0845 April 11, 2020 CE. 0722 Sun 11, 196 AE. Elven Invasion Army of the Empire HQ. Field Marshal Zhao's Kintimal didn't know what to do at this point. The Americans now controlled the skies. Most of the elves' aircraft have been destroyed before they could even take off. Those that could were all shot out of the skies like mere flies. American ground forces were also streaming in from everywhere. The Imperials were there too but they were of no concern to him. It has been only retreat upon retreat ever since the defense at the Verona failed. He cursed at the Americans. He understood that everything was going perfectly before they showed up and ruined it all. He paced around his tent. Then everything went black for him. A glint shone off of the camera on a Predator drone in the sky. It started turning left. Behind a computer screen, an American drone operator watched the explosion from his Predator's Hellfire missile. Elves below ran around in a panic. Target eliminated. That should be a part of their chain of command crippled. The Predator drone had been loitering around the Elven camp for a while in order to identify the command center. From satellite observations, it had been noted to be a very large camp that had the high probability of being the enemy headquarters for the invasion force. Of course, they couldn't identify the specific area that was the command center so they needed a drone to check it out. In many other elven camps on Magasian territory, similar strikes by predator drones were made. Of Valen, Elven Nation. Leader's Mansion. My leader, the commander of the invasion force of the Empire has been killed. A small American Hexenbison struck and killed him. Terran stood up and started pacing around. He was expressionless. He walked towards the door where the messenger was standing and grabbed his coat from the coat hanger. He walked out. 
The high command office was bustling with activity. Staff and officers ran around. To them, everything that could go wrong was going wrong. Orders were not being sent out and reports were not being received. The chain of command for the elven army in the empire was a complete mess. What's the current situation? Field Marshal Agord Gale hesitated at Terran's question for a moment before answering truthfully. Disastrous, my leader. All forces are currently retreating. Our chain of command in the Empire is gone. We don't have a clear picture of the Americans' advance but they have crossed the Verona at terrifying speeds. Take me to the other generals, I'm calling a meeting. Terran looked around. What are your suggestions? Field Marshal Gale spoke up. It seemed like he already knew before the meeting what he wanted to say. We must retreat. I suggest that all forces in the Empire be brought back to our land as soon as possible. All the other generals around him nodded. Almost the entire territory south of the Verona is still in our hands and you are telling me to allow a retreat all the way back home. My leader, we haven't won a single battle ever since the Americans came. If we put an ocean between our forces and theirs, it is possible that we can hold them off. If all our forces die in the Empire, then a large portion of our army will be gone. I do not believe the prospects are good for the survival of our nation if our army fights to the last man in enemy territory. Terran's face darkened. That usually meant that he really wanted to throw something or shoot someone in anger. A heavy silence fell on the room for a minute. Tell all units to begin a retreat. We are evacuating from the Empire. The generals nodded again with relief on their faces. Terran knew that the Empire did not exist anymore and the currency country that they were invading was called the Magus Imperium but most elves still preferred to call it the Empire. All their military plans for attacking the humans in the Imperatoria continent had been written using the word Empire so changing it to the Magus Imperium and creating a separate plan for the Mach Imperium was unnecessary hassle. He then remembered something. What about the ones in the kingdoms? The situation in the Empire had been worsening so much recently that reports from the Kingdom were being glanced over or just put aside. Terran barely knew the exact status of the Elven army invading the Kingdoms. Because of our diversion of forces to support our army in the Empire, the advance in the Kingdoms has considerably slowed. We have gained assistance from the Human Kingdom that we allied with and we are hoping that we can use their numbers to allow us to continue our advance. If the situation worsens over there, immediately inform me. Yes, my leader. 1026 April 11, 2020 CE. 0813 Sun 11, 196 AE. Frontline. Every single operation so far had been a failure. Offensives, counter-offensives, and defenses have all failed no matter what they tried. Now even her superior had gone silent. Every request for orders and questions have been met with nothing. For all Era knew, they could have abandoned her and her division. She had been retreating with her beleaguered division and the rest of the second wave. They were burning almost every single thing they found in order to slow the Americans down and deny them resources. Every railroad was broken apart. Every house burned. Every road dug up. But it had no effect on the advancing American army. It was as if their supply lines stretched endlessly and the terrible road and rail conditions didn't matter. About 20 miles back. Got another blown up road, Captain. Why? Those elves really brought a lot of TNT. Well, just drive over them again. The M1A2 Abrams rattled over the cratered road. 1205 April 12, 2020 CE. 0603 Sun 12th. 196 AE, in the sea between the UBK and Soena continent mainland. The breeze of the sea made Ron's fur flutter. He was looking over the side of the ship. Jeb Miller was beside him. Miller looked down at Ron who was gazing at the horizon line. First time on the sea? Not really. My first time was during the Second Rebellion. I was serving with Mother during that time. The Second Rebellion. It was five years ago when the Second Rebellion happened. The UBK originally was a bunch of separate kingdoms and quite a lot of beastmen wanted it to be like that again. I was 11 at the time. 
I had to board the ship with the rest of the division to fight in many of the other kingdoms in the UBK. You were fighting at age 11. Dear gods no, I was an attendant. An attendant. Rank even lower than a squire. Basically menial tasks with no training or fighting whatsoever. I just had to prepare mother for battle. Miller nodded. Then when was your first one? Ron looked up at Miller in confusion. What do you mean? Your first rebellion. That was 15 years ago. I was dropped off during the first rebellion. Dropped off. Abandoned. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to. Meh, I don't mind. Miller remembered something that Ron had said a few days ago. But didn't you say you were abandoned by your parents because of unknown circumstances? Wasn't it highly probable that you were abandoned because of the war? Ron vehemently shook his head. Of course not, the first rebellion didn't affect the Cat Kingdom that much. There were minor incidents during that time in the Cat Kingdom but nothing big enough to have parents abandoning their kittens. Oh, they went back to looking at the scenery. Commander Wolfred was inside the ship flipping a gold coin. One of the hundreds of coins that he received as payment from the UBK. Gold was much more valuable in the United States than in the UBK. With the amount of gold they had received, the Diamond Wolves had profited a lot. Even with all the axe and ammo that they had to buy and provide to the feline beastmen, they had enough left over that they could probably buy an entire U.S. military outpost if one was being sold. 0445 April 12th, 2020 CE. 0522 Sun 12th, 196 AE. Of Valen, Elven Nation. Admiral Adurm Vainery was in a terrible mood when he stepped onto his flagship, the aircraft carrier NN Conqueror. Frontline. Captain John Rose had half of his body out of the commander's hatch of his speeding tank. He looked at the scenery. They have been advancing for hours upon hours after crossing the Verona and it has been mostly uneventful. They had captured a few groups of elves, witnessed the elves' scorched earth tactics, and experienced minor confrontations that usually ended with the elves running away. Chapter 54 Part 1, Guantanamo Bay, New Frontier 0612 April 12, 2020 CE 0624 Sun 12, 196 AE Somewhere in the Elven Nation Soldiers tossed bushes, twigs, and various types of vegetation onto the artillery pieces. It was noted that the Americans had the capability to locate elven units with ease. How they were doing it was still in question but precautions were being taken. In order to combat this problem, Terran had ordered the application of various types of camouflage onto Magipanzers, artillery, bunkers, and nearly everything else that can hide. Magipanzers were being painted green on top and grasses were placed onto the turrets. 1800 April 12th 2020 CE, 0000 Sun 13, 196 AE, the northern beaches of the Elven Nation. In near complete darkness, a zodiac boat was quietly zipping through the waters. It quickly slid onto a beach. Six men jumped out and the boat was deflated. They quickly unpacked. One of the men put on his night vision goggles. He silently walked up the sand mound and scanned around. He signaled to the others that the coast was clear. After completely unpacking within a few minutes, they quickly moved inland. 0359 April 13, 2020 CE. 0459 Sun 13, 196 AE. Eastern side of the Elven Nation. One of the largest combined deployment of naval units in Elven history was happening right in front of his eyes. Admiral Aram held no joy at it. A few weeks ago, he would have been extremely proud of leading such a force but now his face seemed stone cold. To him, this was just a suicide mission. He looked down at his watch. It was 5 o'clock. Set off. 5 fleet carriers, 5 light carriers, 5 battleships, 20 cruisers, 85 destroyers, and 95 submarines set off for the American West Coast. It was more than half of the entire Elven fleet. 0436 April 13, 2020 CE, Guantanamo Bay Naval Base, Cuba New Frontier. Although located in a somewhat similar topography as the original Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, it was now connected to the mainland. 
The Pentagon was a bit annoyed by this fact since it meant the possibility of prisoners escaping and hiding in the surrounding forests. Nevertheless, it was still being used. When it was transported from Earth to the New World, it came under attack by the Phoenixes. Luckily a US Army unit that had been stationed in Iraq had also been transported nearby. They had taken casualties but air support was able to be called in and the Phoenixes were dealt with. Now a C-130 Hercules transport aircraft came in for a landing on the airfield. The door on it opened once it came to a stop. Come on, get off. An elf was shoved out of the plane and landed face first on the runway. Whoa, be careful with them. I have had enough of keeping an eye on these fucking bastards. I will lead the rest off. The extremely frustrated soldier walked off and started dragging the elf that he had shoved off. The elves were all blindfolded, gagged, and tied at all the limbs. Originally only their hands were tied together. After a plane trip across the ocean, even their legs were bound. A few hours later, inside the detention camp, one of the elves finally had his blindfold taken off. His eyes darted around in the slightly lit room. The only other person in the room was the human who took off his blindfold. The human was clearly armed and seemed ready to shoot at any sign of anything going wrong. Suddenly a voice was heard. It didn't come from the human in the room. Now then, the voice sighed before continuing. Depending on how well you cooperate, you will either have a relaxing day or a not so relaxing one. Now, I have multiple questions that I hope you will answer. Get his gag off. The human in the room followed the order. Fuck you, you human. We will kill you all. Our armies will. The voice cut him off. It was louder this time. MHM. Okay. Now, the first question. Who's your leader? Our glorious leader will trample you all. Just wait and see you pitiful. Let me ask again. Who is your leader? His name. Our glorious leader Terran Van Harris. You shall tremble when you hear of his name you insignify. Do you know what he looks like? Can you give us a description? Why should I tell you that, you vermin? There was a short silence. Okay, next question. Do you know how large your navy is? Our navy? Our glorious navy is tremendous. Their guns will blast your cities to smithereens. How large is it? You will be groveling at our feet soon you inferior. The voice sighed and grumbled a bit. I guess we are doing it the hard way. Take him to his cell. Make sure he doesn't get a wink of sleep. Also no food. Let's see how he likes Gitmo hospitality. None of the captured were very high ranking so the information asked of them involved questions that were less secretive but still important to know. The sizes of their military, their training, their goal, and other things. Of course, none of them willingly answered much so they were subjected to some conditioning. Chapter 54 Part 2, Guantanamo Bay, New Frontier, Washington, D.C. President Hayes was having a meeting to discuss the next steps of the war against the elves. How should we proceed with the invasion of the elven homeland? Secretary of Defense Krilson was there to brief him on the overall situation and plan. We will begin with a 48-hour air and missile campaign to eliminate as much of the enemy as we can. We will target military bases, government buildings, and known positions. Then there will be multiple beach landings with air support. Once the beachheads are established, they will meet with each other and we will push inland. As of right now, Green Berets have already moved in. They should be gathering information and transferring it back to us quite soon. Ugh. We don't know how hard they are willing to fight. What secret weapons they have up their sleeves. And most of all, whether or not they have developed the bomb. It was clear that the elves had a secret weapon program but it was to an unknown extent. The US government feared that the elves might have already created an atom bomb. Although it was no threat to the US homeland, it was a major cause for concern for the invasion force. If the elves had buried it in the ground and set it to explode once US forces were on top of it, there was no telling the amount of damage it could inflict. Guantanamo Bay, New Frontier Two CIA agents were having a quick discussion in their office. So how are our elven guests doing? Pretty terrible. That's good to hear. Any of them willing to spill anything yet? 
there are about as nationalistic as the Japanese were during World War II. Military intelligence was not kidding when they complained about their lack of cooperation. I'm taking that as a no then. We are tempting them with food and better conditions but man their nationalism must have been put into them from the moment they were born. They have already been starved, beat, left in the extreme cold and heat, forced to stay awake, and put into extremely uncomfortable positions. They aren't budging. We may need to switch to harsher methods soon. Give it one or two more days. I rather not have to view the harsher methods. Me neither but we have to do what we have to do. Wait, since this is considered US territory, are we still allowed to do our you know, methods? Well, if you read the 50-page document detailing the annexation of the new frontier, there's a small clause somewhere in the middle that makes this area of the new frontier, not a US territory in the name of preserving the natural wildlife of this world or some excuse. Well doesn't that mean having this structure is disturbing the wildlife? The clause says that it doesn't allow for any new buildings to be built. Then how are we going to upgrade our facilities? The agent chuckled. Emphasis on the new. Elven landing zones in the Magus Imperium. The temporary ports constructed at the start of the Elven invasion of the Empire were extremely busy. Magi Panzers were being driven back onto the landing craft and transport ships. Platoons of elves hurried across the coast. Crates were quickly being loaded on. Everyone was in a hurry. They knew that they couldn't evacuate everyone but they were going to try. The Americans were extremely close. They had been constantly harassed by American aircraft and even at sea, the harassment didn't stop. From her hatch, Era looked out at the sea towards her homeland. Her Blitzpanzer division, trained and focused on the specific use of speed, had easily outpaced the rest of the second wave army. Her division was assigned to a ship that would depart within two hours. It was easy because she didn't have that many Magi Panzers. From the casualties she had suffered during the battles and retreats, it wasn't much of a division anymore and was more comparable to a battalion. A total of 63 Magi Panzers remained out of the original 321. She was still surprised that she herself survived the entire ordeal. She had started to consider retiring soon. Frontline. Keep firing? We must let them through the perimeter. The second wave army, bolstered by parts of the third wave army, fought a retreating battle. They had to hold on for as long as possible for the evacuations to finish. The last of their Dragon Artillery battalions fired their large bursts before being blown up by bombs that came from unknown places. The Americans have been bombarding the retreating elven forces that were even further behind the defending elven units. However, it was clear that the Americans were focused on trying to break through the defensive position. Coast of Elven Nation my leader, good to see you here. Although his words were positive, the way that they were spoken were definitely not. It was clear why. Zeno was out in the sun. Firing the Hexenbasons when it was raining didn't seem like a good idea. Flying experimental aircraft in the rain wasn't a good idea either but Zeno had been extremely insistent on it and gave the excuse that it was a good test of its all-weather capabilities so it was allowed. However, his wish of firing the Hexenbasons when it was raining was denied. It wasn't a test so failure because the weather would have been unacceptable and the firing had to happen soon so they couldn't wait for rain. Are you sure they will hit? We are firing multiple Hexenbasons. All targeted at the Americans on the coasts that they have reached. Although not a hundred percent accurate, some are bound to hit and do damage. Flames appeared below the first Hexenbasson as it started to rocket towards the sky. Coast of the Magus Imperium. We are detecting multiple incoming missiles. All targeted at our ground forces in the area. Chapter 55, Infiltration. 0844 April 13, 2020 CE. 0722 Sun 13, 196 A. Magus Imperium near the ocean. Even though it was still morning, the sun had been up hours ago. In an open field, Six unhooked Patriot systems sat with their launchers pointed in the air. Behind the systems were an unslash MPQ-65 and the engagement control station. A three-man crew was inside the station. We got multiple tracks on the radar. What are they? Three, five, 
eight missiles heading towards our direction. In the engagement control station, the TCO, tactical control officer, watched as multiple dots appeared on the radar screen. He looked at the radio operator, contact headquarters. The TDA, tactical director assistant, looked up from his radio and at his superior. Tactical director, one of our batteries is detecting missiles. Give me the radio. I recommend that we shoot them down immediately. Okay, give me a second. Let me check the track and contact the Adafco. Understood, sir. A few minutes later, you are free to fire at will at all current targets. Understood. We will proceed immediately. The TCO put down the radio and turned to the TCA, tactical control assistant. Engage the tracks. One missile flew out of one of the 16th Solid Patriot systems. A few seconds later, a second missile launched from the same system. A few feet away, another one also fired. As per protocol, two POC-3 missiles were fired for each enemy missile. The first POC-3 quickly cruised through the sky. The altitude control motor started to adjust the POC-3's trajectory. It got closer and closer to one of the elven hexenbasons. It slammed into the hexenbason. In the air, a bright flash of a ball of orange occurred. Within minutes, multiple other bright flashes could be seen in the sky as the POC-3 missiles struck the stream of hexenbasons. The TCA looked at the radar screen. All missiles have been eliminated. Detection station near the coast, Elven Nation. A few minutes ago, how are the hexenbasons? They seem to be doing fine. All on course. The Elven Mud, Mana Usage Detector, operator watched as the dots that represented the fired hexenbasons blinked forwards. The MUDs had a much longer range of detection than the MWEs, Mana Wave Emitter, since elves have been using and developing Magi Tech for more than a few thousand years. Their foray into mech tech, their word for any complicated mechanical technology, only started about 500 years ago. Thus the MWEs, capable of detecting any large physical objects, were much less developed than the MUDs, capable of detecting any sort of magic usage. One of the dots of the hexenbasons stopped blinking. The operator looked back at his commander. Hmm. One of them might have landed too early. Then a few more stopped blinking. Concern was obvious on the operator. They are all landing too early. Did we give them enough fuel? I'm pretty sure the ground crews gave them more than enough. The last of the dots stopped blinking. The commander sighed. Get headquarters. There is a high chance that a malfunction occurred on them. Of Valen, Elven Nation. Terran was pacing around the control room as Zeno tried to explain what had happened. There might be a malfunction in the hexenbasons. We will need to look if there were any engineering issues with them. From my knowledge, there shouldn't have been any. Ugh. We will have to take one apart and look through it piece by piece. None of the hexenbasons had reached their intended targets. All of them dropped into the ocean at nearly the exact same location. Based on that, many thought that there might be a common problem within all of the hexenbasons. If they could locate the problem, they believed they could fix it. Terran continued to pace around in frustration. 1110 April 13, 2020 CE. 0835 Sun 13, 196 AE. Somewhere in the Elven Nation. In a cave, a few men looked through their backpacks. When they had arrived, they had quickly traveled further inland just in case there were elf patrols on the beaches. Everyone has their ears on and secured right. Yep. Of course. A few others nodded. Pull on them to make sure. They tugged at their pointy ears. The ears almost felt lifelike when touching. Okay, good. Make one last check on your clothing and weapons and put all the backpacks into the back. The men meticulously checked their clothing and the guns they had on them. They set their backpacks down in a corner in the cave. A blanket that was the same color as the walls of the cave covered the backpacks. Okay, Robert, you know the drill. Make sure no one discovers what's in this cave. Keep your radio open. Robert, the warrant officer, nodded. Leaving half of the team behind, the six men set off. Less than 30 minutes later. Hello there, 
We are travelers from a long way who are a bit lost. Can you direct us to the nearest town? An old elven in a horse-drawn cart looked at the six elves standing on the side of the road. He pushed up his straw hat and regarded them carefully. The elves remained calm. The old elven pointed down the road behind him. Shouldn't be that far. Less than an hour of walk and you will get to the town of Conallen. All right, thanks. The old elven nodded and pulled the reins to get his horses moving again. Good to know that these disguises work. We just have to put on some pointy ears and wear clothing suitable to their era. Nothing too big. They were walking down a dirt road with no one around. It seems that this area was rural. 1220 April 13, 2020 CE. 0910 Sun 13, 196 AE. Elven temporary ports in the Magus Imperium. With her Magipanzer loaded up in the ship, Era looked out at the sea. She was happy that she was finally getting out of this hellhole. She has heard from many about the transport ships being attacked by undetectable submarines but felt that she had a better chance of survival on the ocean than on dry land. It was clearly only a matter of time before American land and air forces would arrive and start bombarding their position. Even with hundreds of thousands of elves still fighting, it was clear that it was a losing battle. She could even hear some of the sounds of the battle that was occurring miles away. Frontline. The Americans are breaking through. Negative. We are unable to direct any to your sector as of right now. We can't hold. We are retreating. Negative. Orders are still in place. Fight to the last elf. Deserters will be shot. Explosions, whizzing bullets, and screaming could be heard everywhere. The elven soldier threw the headphones for the Magi radio down onto the ground and cursed loudly. An American aircraft screamed past overhead. Elves hid behind the husks of their destroyed Magi panzers, occasionally popping out and shooting at the advancing Americans. New Elven HQ. Where's the rain ZZZZZ? The Magi radios in the tents were spilling out with the panicked sounds of the soldiers at the front. The Magi radio operators struggled to keep up. With most of the high-ranked officers in command of the invasion forces dead, the elves were forced to form an ad hoc chain of command with a group of lieutenant generals and major generals on top. The elven headquarters have been placed in an unremarkable area filled with trees after the original headquarter that had been placed in open plains was devastated by American bombing. The generals bickered about the next plan of action. Frontline. Stiff resistance from the elves ground the American advance to nearly a halt. Arriving at what was another one of the elven's lines of defense, they were bombarded by artillery and rocket artillery. Even more, elven armored vehicles appeared in swarms. At certain points of the front, the elves even outnumbered the Americans by 50 to 1. Two lines of Magasian soldiers hid behind an Abrams. They slowly advanced as it drove forward. Keep your head down and don't peek out. The Magasian that were crouching behind the American Magi tank was thankful that it had been so far impenetrable. None of the elves' weapons seemed to have any effect. In comparison, the Magasian's Magi tank had been completely worthless in protecting them. It would have been destroyed in a single shot. An Abrams beside them started to drive backward. Our main gun is toast. We are getting out. Its machine gun continued to fire at the anti-tank guns lining the small hill. Elves were pushing out the destroyed anti-tank guns and replacing them with new ones. Occasionally an elven armored vehicle will appear only to be taken out a few seconds later. All units pull out. Steel rain bout to shred them. The American Magi Panzer started to pull back. They continued firing but it was clear that they were running. Their infantry was turning back too. The elves on the hill, seeing this, started to cheer. Then thousands of small pieces of metal blanketed the area. A few minutes later, the commanding officer shook his head. We need engineers to clear a path. Tell them to get their explosives and bulldozers. Actually, maybe we should just call a bombing run on this. Explosives and bulldozers aren't gonna be enough. A literal wall of corpses and metal blocked the advance. 1235 April 13, 2020 CE. 0917 Sun 13, 
196 AE. Con Allen, Elven Nation. The town was bustling with elves. Elven children ran around seemingly without a care in the world. Five elves walked on the streets looking around. The buildings beside them were all lined up neatly. A few elves were walking around. The team's commanding officer, Pablo Carter walked up to one of the elves. Excuse me, sir. Do you happen to know where we can find a map? We are travelers who have gotten lost. A block down, there is an inn. You can go in there and ask around. They should have maps for sale. Thanks, sir. They handed the two maps to the innkeeper. Five bronze. Bronze was not actual bronze but was a type of bill. The elven currency system was a bit complicated. They solely relied on paper money that was printed out as one of three types. Bronze, silver, and gold. The value of each was obvious. They handed the innkeeper five bronze. These were not real. They were counterfeit bills made to look as much like the real thing as possible. It was a good thing that a couple of the captured elven soldiers had been carrying cash on them. The innkeeper didn't even look at the bills and quickly placed them in the register. Near the ocean, elven nation. Bulldozers dug into the ground. They made small rectangular pits. A guard Magi Panzer drove into it. Its body was inside the pit while the turret was outside with its gun pointing forward. Multiple pits for Magi Panzers were created. Anti-tank the guns were dug in. Grass and leaves were thrown on top of them. Chapter 56, Abandoned. 1152 April 13th, 2020 CE. 0856 Sun 13th, 196 AE. Airfield miles behind the front line. First Lieutenant Scott Miller rested on his bed in the barracks. Simple bunk beds lined the interior of the barracks. He was more used to the apartment dorm style that they had at their base. Back home on his base, he even had his own room, but right now he didn't really care. His squadron had been doing endless sorties a day. There never seemed to be an end to the number of elves that they had to blow to craters. It was a cycle of landing his aircraft, taking a few minutes of break, getting loaded up with missiles and bombs, and lifting off to take care of more of them. His squadron was even called to bomb the already destroyed sectors because the army just couldn't get through the sheer amount of destruction. 1304 April 13, 2020 CE. 0932 Sun 13, 196 AE. Frontline. There was a distinct rumbling coming from the red sky. American aircraft? American aircraft. The elves that had crowded the road scrambled to disperse. An elf had an injured elf's arm slung over him. The injured elf was missing a leg so he couldn't walk fast. Heavily injured and maimed elves were everywhere. Come on, quickly. Magi trucks and Magi Panzers drove off the road. We are getting out of the Magi Panzer? But sir, I'm not dying in this metal box. Corporal Dejour quickly climbed out of his commander hatch and jumped down to run. He and his crew had been lost for multiple days. He was pretty sure that they had been behind enemy lines multiple times without knowing it. Being a lone guard Magi Panzer retreating from the front line, they weren't targeted by American aircraft until they had rejoined their forces. It was complete hell afterward and his Magi Panzer had been nearly obliterated. At this point, he has had enough. 1335 April 13, 2020 CE. 0947 Sun 13. 196 A. Con Allen, Elven Nation. Pablo looked out of his in-room's window. The sun had finally gone down and lamps lit the streets of the town. There were a few cars in the streets and some elves walking around. He held his radio to his mouth. Not a soldier in sight. We were able to secure maps but I don't believe that we will get much else from the residents of this town. Meet up at the north entrance at 1500 and bring everything. We will observe the town further until then. Out. Copy. Over. They had gotten the room for a few hours under the excuse of taking a rest. The rooms weren't expensive and they had brought along a lot of counterfeit bills so it was fine. Pablo turned to Operations Sergeant Dennis Richard. Round up everyone we will be visiting the local bar. Noise was everywhere. Elves were laughing. Beer jugs were hitting each other. 
The door swung open and six elves walked in. The bustle of the bar continued. It wasn't irregular for groups of elves to come into the bar so no one cared. They sat down at an empty round table. A waitress came up. She smiled at them. Hello there boys, what can I get for you? We are travelers. What drink would you recommend? Our most popular item would be our classic beer. Then all of us will be getting one. We are just here for a drink. She nodded. Well, coming right up. A few minutes later, an elf waiter came to their table. They looked in surprise at the elf. It wasn't an elf. His ears weren't pointy. It was a human who had a collar around his neck. Here are your beers esteemed sirs. After placing the beers on the table, he bowed his head. The team looked at the human walking away. They looked at each other. Drinking for a bit, they listened to the conversations around them. One quickly caught their attention. A group of elves were sitting at a table not that far away. Have you guys heard? There are rumors that the war isn't going quite in our favor. Really? Why do you think we are building all these defenses all around the coasts and the fields for? The papers keep saying that we are winning but it's not as detailed as before. Something is most definitely wrong. Are you sure? Wasn't it predicted that the humans shouldn't have technology capable of defeating us? And look, we are even able to buy human slaves now. But what if we aren't fighting humans anymore? What do you mean? We have been underwater for hundreds of years. What if another species became superior to the humans? The elf snorted before replying. What species could that be? Maybe the dwarves. They were technologically inferior to the humans. It's been hundreds of years, that could have changed. I have heard stories about the craftsmanship of the dwarves from the Insula continent. But still, to have advanced to the points of beating us. I don't believe it. Hmm, you believe what you believe, but I'm getting ready for an invasion. Paying for their drinks the team stood up and walked out of the bar. They had gathered what they needed. Pablo had heard about the dwarves on the Insula continent. The dwarves could be considered an endangered species. The five three-way colonization wars fought between the Mach, Magus, and Insulin natives basically left the Insula continent barren. 1500 April 13, 2020 CE. 1030 Sun 13, 196 AE. North entrance of Conallen. Their backpacks were handed to them by the other six. We got some extra information when we went to the bar. Seems like the elves are preparing defenses around the area. We will be looking for them. Our satellites did indicate some troop movements here and there but it wasn't significant. Pablo got out the map that they had bought. I want your team to go north to scout that area out. We will move east. Pablo pointed to another spot on the map. The rendezvous point is here near this city. Our main mission is still to gather intelligence on their capital but we can't ignore the possible buildup of defenses that our satellite couldn't spot. The men around him nodded. One of their two weapons sergeants, Frederick Schultz, peered out of his night vision binoculars. The Green Berets had a system of redundancy. In the 12-man team, there were two weapons sergeants, two communications sergeants, two medical sergeants, and two engineering sergeants. This made it easier for them to split into two teams. Yep, those are definitely heavy artillery pieces 15 centimeters. Well camouflaged too for that size. I highly doubt our satellites would be able to spot them. There were multiple camouflaged artillery pieces lying across the field. Well visible on the ground level, viewing it from the air was another question. Frederick scanned to the right. Panzerwerfers too. I also see a couple of anti-tank guns. Not exactly sure which caliber though. I think it's a Pac-43. Pablo nodded. Let's go. We will relay this information back once we get into a less vulnerable position. 1504 April 13, 2020 CE. 1032 Sun 13, 196 AE. Frontline. They drove up near a town. To be exact what remained of a town. It had been completely burned to ashes during the elven invasion. Captain John Rose looked around at the destruction and shook his head. Almost every settlement that the elves had conquered had been destroyed. It was a total war. 
John looked at his map. They were only a couple of miles away from the coast. The remnants of the elves had nowhere to escape to. It was confirmed that all elven ships have left without them. Coast of the Magus Imperium. The retreating elf army came up to the sea. Their temporary ports were barren. There wasn't a single ship in sight. Group of elves from the same unit started forming clumps on the beaches. They were discussing among themselves. Where are our ships? I think they left without us. What do we do now? An elf, a magi radio operator, listened to his magi radio. The other elves looked at him. Someone giving orders. The magi radio elf was silent for a bit as he listened intently. We are getting orders. Seems like a colonel is taking charge. What are we going to do? It seems like we are fighting. Fighting? Is he crazy? We all are going to die. We are still a couple hundred thousand strong. There were nearly four million of us on this continent at the start. What do you think a couple hundred thousand are going to do against them? The Magi radio operator shook his head. Colonel's orders. 1524 April 13, 2020 CE. Washington, D.C. Mr. President, we have the remnants of the Elven invasion force completely surrounded and backed up to the beaches. They have nowhere to escape. President Hayes nodded. How well are we dealing with the ones that had escaped? Our attack submarines are hunting them. However, a large number of their ships will survive. There are just too many of them. Our satellites have gathered details of suspicious activities from a large number of enemy ships. We tried to keep an eye on them but cloudy conditions over the eastern portion of their island are preventing us from doing so. We are expecting that they are preparing for defense. The Navy is gathering a large force to deal with it. 1113 Sun 13th, 196 A. Primopolis, Magus Imperium. An attendant barged in. Emperor Arstant? Great news. What is it? A knock, please. I am just about to retire for the night. Sorry, sir. The Americans have the remaining elven forces surrounded on the beaches. The elves have been almost all pushed out of the country. I guess it's nearly over, so many have perished. How are our men doing? They are doing their best at supporting the Americans at the front, sir. Good. Emperor Arstand was conflicted. He was happy that the elves were finally out of his country. But he knew it was the end of an era. And the beginning of a new one. And this new one won't be dominated by one of the Imperiums. 1524 April 13, 2020 CE. 1042 Sun 13, 196 A. Frontline. We have them completely surrounded but they don't seem to be surrendering. Damn those elves are stubborn. Lieutenant Colonel Manfred Rogers, the commander of the 3rd Battalion, 37th Armor Regiment, part of the 1st Armored Division, wondered about the current situation. He had expected them to surrender seeing that this had no meaning left at all. The elves had nothing to gain if they kept on fighting. It seemed like logic and common sense weren't in their dictionary. A human aircraft flew high overhead. Anti-aircraft crewmen scrambled to their guns. A message was blared out. Please send a negotiator with a white flag so we can discuss terms. I repeat. You have one hour to surrender. Please send a negotiator with a white flag so we can discuss terms. If we do not receive anyone within an hour, may God have mercy on you all. There were surprised murmurs among the elves. The damned humans learned our language. 0925 April 14, 2020 CE. Guantanamo Bay, New Frontier. So are you ready to talk? The CIA agent who originally talked to the elves through a speaker in another room was finally in the interrogation room himself. It was clear that the elves, being tied up, couldn't use their magic. The elf didn't respond. The elf was emaciated. Literal bones could be seen through his skin. Food in the form of meat was right in front of him but he looked away. The agent sighed. Guess we are doing the hard way. Chapter 57, Turntable, 0934 April 14, 2020 CE, Guantanamo Bay, New Frontier. They dragged the elf into a dimly lit room. One of the humans faced him. 
What were your country's plans? What kind of building does your leader live in? What do they look like? How large is your navy? A slap was given on the abdomen each time the elf stayed quiet. Each slap grew stronger and stronger. Answer the damn questions. A slap was given on the face. The elf had tears in his eyes but still spat on the ground. He snorted. You think slapping me for a bit will make me talk? Don't make me laugh. You fucking inferior. He was grabbed and had his face slammed into the wall. You think that's enough to? He was slammed into the wall again. Blood was gushing out of his nose. There were bruises on his face. This process of slapping and walling continued for hours. 1624 April 13, 2020 CE. 1112 Sun 13, 196 AE. Frontline. Lieutenant Colonel Manfred Rogers stretched in his Abrams and sighed. Using night vision, they had kept an eye to see if any elves were coming over to surrender. An hour had just passed and there were no signs of any. He got on his radio to contact the other lieutenant colonels in the 1st Armored Brigade combat teams of the 1st Armored Division. The lieutenant colonel of the 4th Battalion, 1st Field Artillery Regiment that was in their Armored Brigade combat team joined in on the conversation. Zooming past overhead, F-15S unleashed a torrent of bombs onto the disorganized elven forces below. There was a response of blind and inconsistent anti-aircraft fire that had little effect. The elves couldn't even see their targets. Their comrades who had escaped had left behind searchlights. However, the human aircraft was so fast that the searchlights were completely useless. Scott looked out of his F-15S window. Bright orange explosions lit up the pitch black beaches. He gave a thumbs up to his weapon system officer, Gerald Wallace who was sitting in the seat behind him. Scott banked his F-15 to the left to get ready for another bombing run. Corporal DeJour hugged his legs. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Oh gods, please save me. He rocked back and forth in the hole he had dug only a few hours ago. His guard Magi Panzer had been destroyed from an air attack and his crew has already scattered. He didn't even have any weapons on him other than his pistol. He also had no commanders to answer to. Other than the colonel that was currently taking charge, elves were following whoever was the highest ranked of the survivors of their units. Corporal DeJour had no idea where his unit was. It was pitch black in the hole but there were constant flashes from the explosions that shook the ground like an earthquake. Miles behind the front line, all aircraft have dropped their payloads. It's our turn now. The guns on M109A7 Paladins of the 4th Battalion, 1st Field Artillery Regiment all traversed upwards in unison. The blasts of the gun rocked the air. The self-propelled artillery moved back a bit from the force of the blast. A few minutes later, frontline, the explosions stopped. To the elves, it was a sign that the American assault would begin. The elven infantry in their foxholes and poorly organized trenches gripped their weapons and peeked out. The Magipanzer crew stayed quiet in their Magipanzers. Anticipation was heavy in the air. Lights had all been turned off in order to surprise the Americans. Then, the ground shook suddenly. The Americans haven't begun their assault. They were just getting ready for another round of firing. Throughout the night, the firing led up only for short intervals. It switched constantly from American aircraft bombing runs and artillery strikes. A few hours later, a convoy of trucks appeared on the road. The truck in front of the convoy stopped a few yards from the line of firing M109A7S. The lieutenant colonel of the 4th Battalion, 1st Field Artillery Regiment walked to meet the men exiting the truck. He shouted to someone on his left. Bannock. The Magasians are here. Bannock walked up towards them. Are you with the 26th Brigade Field Artillery? Yes. We have orders to support you. You are the 4th Battalion, 1st Field Artillery Regiment correct? A blast from a paladin interrupted their conversation. Yes. We are unsure of the range of your guns so you might need to get closer. Wait a second. Bannock turned towards his lieutenant colonel. We are going to need to give them a map that marks where the elves are. I don't think their guns have the range of ours. 
I will get someone to grab it. Vanek turned back towards the Magasian commanders. Give us a second. We will show you where you need to fire. 2230 April 13th, 2020 CE. 0215 Sun 14th, 195 AE. Cease fire. All around the front, the artillery immediately died down. This command was also given out to the Magasian artillery units through their communication lines. Only the tip of the sun was out of the horizon. For nearly six hours, hundreds of thousands of pounds of bombs and shells were dropped on the elves. Captain John Rose directed his tanks forward. The orders had been given many hours ago. Once the ceasefire order was given to the artillery, all other ground units would begin in advance. Isaac and his infantry platoon slowly walked forward. They had disembarked from their Bradleys earlier. The ground was full of craters. It seemed highly doubtful that anybody had survived. Then they heard voices. We surrender, we surrender, please don't shoot. They couldn't understand them but it was clear from their hands that were up and the lack of weapons they were carrying that they were surrendering. An American infantryman looked down into a foxhole. He laughed. Hey, this guy in this hole is still alive. Get over here. You gotta look at this. He's asleep. A few other infantrymen walked towards the hole. Hey, wake up. Huh. W.H. Dejour blinked his eyes and looked around before slowly putting his hands up. There were humans surrounding his hole and had their guns pointed at him. He realized that he had fallen asleep during the bombardment since it was day now. 0424 April 14th. 2020 CE. 0512 Sun 14th, 195 AE. Of Valen, Elven Nation. Zeno was pacing around in Terran's office. He had some dark circles under his eyes. There is absolutely nothing wrong with the Hexenbissons. I'm sure of it. We looked through everything, every little detail. They should have worked. Terran sighed. But they didn't. Are you sure you aren't overlooking anything? Unless they were shot down, then I haven't overlooked anything. The fuel consumption is correct. There were no problems with the rocket and Zeno got interrupted. Wait, stop. What? Say the first few words of what you just said again. He blinked. Unless they were shot down, then. Stop. What? You can't be serious. The Hexenbissons have a speed of more than 700 miles per hour. Nearly the speed of sound. Nothing can shoot it down. Terran sighed yet again. Nothing in our arsenal but what about the Americans? Their aircraft obviously can go faster than the speed of sound. It won't be far-fetched if they have technology capable of shooting down aircraft that can fly at the speed of sound. We have technology capable of shooting down our own aircraft. The Americans should have technology capable of shooting down their own too. Terran shook his head before continuing. The Hexenbissons aren't going to work. I'm putting a stop to all Hexenbisson production. What? You can't just do this. They will work. If we fire a large enough amount of them, then we can surely overwhelm whatever defenses they have set up. Terran set down his pen. I know you were very invested in this project but we need the material for the jets. The Hexenbissons aren't working and we don't have time to produce more. Even if it's just an issue as you originally said and it wasn't the Americans shooting them down, we don't have time to fix it. 0506 April 13, 2020 CE. 0533 Sun 14, 195 AE. Somewhere in the Pacific, Admiral Adurm Vainery sat quietly in his office. His aircraft carrier rocked up and down in the violent waves. A large storm system was over them. Outside, the sky was dark and the waves were ceaseless. A massive formation of ships moved forwards, each ship going up and down the violent tides. Joint Region Marianas, Guam. A radar operator started to look a bit panicked as he watched his screen. Holy shit. Um, guys, you guys gotta take a look at this. Is there an issue with the radar? I don't think it is, um, it might be the entire Elven Navy. Washington, D.C. President Hayes was clearly agitated. How did the satellites not see that large of a fleet? It's a 100-ship fleet for crying out loud. 
Secretary of Defense Krilson had a glum look on his face. Clouds, sir. By their luck, a massive storm is moving through that entire area. What units do we currently have based in Guam? Not much. We have stopped the continuous rotation of our bomber forces there since we no longer have any adversaries in the Pacific. It is also much faster to go across the Atlantic to reach the Imperium so units have been redeploying from Guam. However, from the direction that they are going, they are going to completely miss Guam. They are heading straight for Hawaii. Krilson paused shortly before continuing again. We have time. If they were going for Guam, we would have been in trouble. We can rush a response using ships, submarines, and aircraft from Naval Base San Diego and Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. There are also additional units in other naval bases and Air Force bases across the West Coast. We can father what we have and assemble an organized response. If push comes to shove, we can try to reactivate the USS Missouri in Honolulu. The USS Missouri? The battleship? Isn't that just a museum piece now? How are we even going to use it as a naval ship? I doubt it can even move. Well, we are not going to use it as a ship. We can use it as a stationary missile platform. There are four MK-141 harpoon launchers and eight MK-143 armored box launchers that were installed in the late 1980s. Those weapon platforms can probably be reactivated in time. Phalanx CIWs that can maybe still be used. We need everything we have got. Chapter 58, Preparing for Future Battles. 0215 April 14, 2020 CE. West Coast of the United States. USS John C. Stennis. Rear Admiral Charlie Kirkland looked sternly over the horizon. The sun had yet to rise for the new day. He shook his head. This will be one hell of a fight. In addition to the ships in the carrier strike group of the USS John C. Stennis, 13 Arleigh Burke class destroyers, 7 Los Angeles class submarines, 5 Ticonderoga class cruisers, 4 Virginia class submarines, and even both some Walt class destroyers were at or sailing towards Hawaii, Tucson Air National Guard Base, Arizona. Lights lit up the base. Pilots ran onto the runway and towards their planes. The alarms of the base seemed like they were going haywire. They quickly climbed into their F-16A-BS and F-16C-DS. Although designed for air superiority, the F-16 Fighting Falcon was considered a multi-role aircraft. They were capable of carrying and were currently equipped with anti-ship missiles. One by one, they taxied onto the runway. The 162nd Fighter Wing which was based at the Tucson Air National Guard Base, was flying to the Hickman Air Force Base. The Hawaii Air National Guard that was based at the Hickam Air Force Base had the 154th Wing which was only equipped with F-22S. Those would be useful against the naval aircraft that the elves have brought but useless against any of the elven ships. On the west coast, squadrons of jets were taking off from Air Force and Air National Guard bases. 0724 April 14, 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. We have also detected a large number of submarines. However, the exact number is unknown. The president was visibly irritated at the news. How bad is the situation? Will they be able to reach Hawaii? Our current analysis of the situation still deems it highly unlikely that they will be able to reach Hawaii. Even with Guam closer to the United States than our original world, we still have time. The president started drumming his fingers on the desk. What to do, what to do? It's clear that we have to crush them. Yes, Krilson, I understand that. I'm worried about the civilians. If we fail, Hawaii would be in danger. A million people live there. Should we call for an evacuation? I need to assure the people that we can handle the situation. Should we keep it a secret to prevent mass panic? It has been more than 80 years since an enemy nation has ever attacked American soil. And it would be at the same location. During his presidency, he took a deep breath and his drumming turned louder. 0811 April 14, 2020 CE. 0705 Sun 14, 195 A. Beaches of the Magus Imperium. 
Isaac and one of his squadmates wandered down the beach. Although under the pretense of looking for more elves, they were just having a leisurely walk. Isaac watched as his squadmate kicked at one of the charred remains of an elf. How many prisoners is this? Isaac looked up at the question. From what I have heard, nearly 50,000. His squadmate whistled at the number. Have we ever gotten this large amount of POWs? Probably back in World War II or something. Still, it's surprising that that many are still alive. Isaac glanced around at the elven bodies lying on the beaches. I'm pretty sure this is going to be a headache to handle for whoever is handling this. Poor guy. Isaac chuckled. Good thing we are just grunts. Captain Rose looked out at the ocean from the cratered beach. He knew that they would be sailing across very soon. Elven weapons were strewn all over the blackened sand. The burnt-out husk of an elven tank was just a few yards away. Around him, the infantry was guiding the surviving elves off the beach. Of Valin, Elven Nation. The headquarters was bustling with elves. The situation has been turning worse and worse by the day. High-ranking officers talked amongst themselves. We have lost contact with multiple of the other convoys. We have also received absolutely no reports of the sinking of any of their submarines. How bad is it? We are expecting a 60% survival rate. All the officers went quiet. That was a couple hundred thousand casualties. The leader would not be happy with that. The ocean between the Elven Nation and Magus Imperium. The journey has so far been extraordinarily smooth. It was surprising in comparison to the hell she had experienced from the Americans during her retreat. Era placed a hand on her knight. Its metal armor glinted in the sun. She thought back to her mother. She quietly sprouted out her thoughts as if she wanted to confirm them. Maybe I really should try settling down. Finding someone nice to marry doesn't seem too bad right now. If it was a month ago, she would have scoffed at the idea. Distinguishing herself was all she could think about in the past. Somewhere in the elven nation, the two Green Beret split teams have rejoined each other after scouting their areas out. They had been on the move all night and morning. Finding a comfortable and secure place, the two weapon sergeants started conversing. They have done immense amounts of preparation in these areas. They are throwing whatever they have together. They seem to be using some of their outdated arsenals. I spotted some clearly older, WW1-era style artillery pieces and tanks. They look extremely strange but by technological comparison, they are definitely WW1. Well, from what we have learned about the elves from the information we gathered from the natives, those strange-looking WW1-era tanks and artillery are probably about 150 years old. I'm surprised they are even in working condition. We didn't find any outdated 150-year-old weird equipment from our investigation. In this area over here, they are much less prepared but they are all definitely German-style WW2-era equipment. They are currently still in the process of fortifying. I'm not sure how our satellites haven't been able to spot any of the movement for this. The assistant operations and intelligence sergeant commented on that. This continent is extremely rich in temperate forests. They could have just decided to move them through the forests instead of the roads. Why would they do that though? They should have no understanding of our reconnaissance technology. Maybe they do suspect that we have the capability to view them using satellites. Do they even know what satellites are? Doubtful. They have been underwater all this time. However, it's likely that they felt it extremely fishy that we were able to strike their forces at any time and anywhere. Pablo nodded at the conversation and turned towards one of the communications sergeants. Start sending this information back. Inform HQ that we will go back to our main objective. They had brought along radios for communication with headquarters. It was ascertained that the elves could not intercept their radios. The elves relied on mana waves for communications so it was doubtful if the elves had any technology capable of listening in on radio waves. 0933 April 14, 2020 CE, Washington, D.C. President Hayes was in another deep discussion of the current situation. Although the elves in the Pacific are clearly an issue, we still can't neglect the invasion of the elves' homeland. Krilson nodded his head. 
The fanaticism of the elves is a worrisome factor. They do seem more similar to Imperial Japan than Nazi Germany. Is there a way we can exploit this fact? We can do some things similarly but not everything. Keeping the current leader of the elves is not possible. He's the source of this fanaticism. According to the elves we have captured, he also isn't viewed as a god. A large portion of elves themselves have a hatred of humans. What are our choices then? Our most feasible option right now and the one we are currently preparing for is to launch an invasion. There are a few problems with this. We will most certainly meet stiff resistance from their military and the civilian population. In addition, we will have to worry about resistance fighters. This won't be like Iraq in the Gulf War. We faced a total of 900,000 then, the elves here have more than a couple million. It will be a hard fight. Our second option that may solve those issues and may seem like an easier option is to launch a nuclear missile or two and hope that their leader surrenders. If their leader surrenders, then the elves themselves might lose some of their fanaticism. Similar to what happened with Imperial Japan. What's different is that we can just dispose of the elven leader afterward. I highly doubt we can use him as we did with Emperor Hirohito. The president pondered about Krulson's suggestions. What would happen if we launch our missiles and destroy a few of their cities but they don't surrender? Well, we would either have to actually invade them or completely annihilate them using our nuclear weapons. Well, the first one leads back to our first feasible option and the second will certainly cause an outcry from the people. That's why I believe an invasion, however hard it is, is our most feasible option here. 1148 April 14th 2020 CE, 0854 Sun 14, 2020 CE, Elven Nation. The Green Berets were continuing towards their objective at a quick pace. They had already passed a few towns and cities and were able to gather the current circumstances of the civilians. From what more they had observed, the entire Elven civilian population was barely informed of their current predicament but they did seem to have an inkling that something was going wrong. However, they had immense trust in their leader and brushed it off. The elven newspapers were clearly filled with propaganda and falsehoods. Articles ranged from saying that they were winning and that the human empire has already fallen to advertisements for human slaves. There were many pictures in the newspapers of their past victorious battles against the Magus. 1148 April 14, 2020 CE. 0554 Sun 14. 2020 CE, Kingdom of Albia, so in a continent. Miller got out of the Humvee to stretch. He looked back at Wolfred who was sitting in the driver's seat. That was a long trip. We are a few miles from the front line. Seems like these Nazi elves haven't made much progress. Well, we are here to push them back. Anyways, I'm exhausted. Let's get some rest. Behind them, other diamond wolves got off of their vehicles. In addition, the Cat Kingdom's 5th Division was further behind. The Diamond Wolves had purchased trucks in order to accompany them. Diamond Wolves Interlude Part 1 1148 April 14, 2020 CE 0554 Sun 14, 2020 CE Kingdom of Albia, so in a continent. Miller stretched. That was quite some journey. We still got work ahead. Would prefer to have a short break. I was the one who drove. You slept nearly the entire trip. Still doesn't feel comfortable being crammed into a vehicle for hours on end. Weren't you in the Marines? You know my military background as clear as day, Commander. Wolfred shook his head. Let's go there's no time to dally. We still have to get everything organized before we can actually go to bed. The area was bustling with soldiers of all shapes and sizes. Wolves, bears, tigers, and many other strong beastmen. There were also human knights. Following Wolfred, Miller walked up to Flametail. Wolfred got her attention. We are here as support attached to your division but I would still like to join in on whatever meetings you high-level officers are having. Of course. I was just told that we should be having one soon. You and your sub-commander can join. Just follow me. They were welcomed by a large bear. Commander Flametail. Good to see you again. It is too, 
Commander Grizzly Jack. Grizzly Jack looked down at Ron and smiled. Ron, how are you doing? Still falling off bridges. Commander Grizzly Jack chuckled at his own comment. Ron bowed. I'm doing well, Commander Grizzly Jack. No need to be so formal. I still remember the time you were just this small and I had to dive into a river to save you after the bridge came out right under you. He looked towards Miller and Wolfred. Ah, you two must be part of the human mercenaries that were hired. Miller felt as if the ground shook from the bear's booming voice. They got their introductions out of the way and were welcomed into the tent for the meeting. There were tigers, jaguars, wolves, bears, and a few other types of beastmen sitting around. There were also a few humans. Sitting at the opposite end of the entrance was a very imposing rhino beastman. Welcome Commander Flametail and Commander Grizzly Jack. They both saluted and replied at the same time. Reporting for duty, Lord Commander. The rhino who was called the Lord Commander turned his attention to Miller and Wolfred. You two must be the mercenaries from the United States. Welcome, Commander Wolfred and Subcommander Miller I presume. I'm Lord Commander Darkhorn. I'm in command of all frontline forces. Wolfred and Miller acknowledged him and the meeting began. He began to speak. We have been fighting the elves for some time right now and we have only been on the defense and retreating. However, it is now time for us to begin our counterattack. We will push them out of the kingdom of Albia. Murmurs rose up in the room among the commanders. Miller and Wolfred stayed quiet and looked around. One of the humans in the room raised his voice above the murmurs. Lord Commander. Yes, Gladwine. With all due respect, sir, how do you expect us to accomplish that? The elves have much more superior technology and there had been no way to get around that? True until now, but with the help of the mercenaries we have hired. The mercenaries? Sir, this is a slight to the honor of knights, depending on mere mercenaries. Commander Flametail has written to me that she holds these mercenaries' abilities in high regard. I have also heard that their country has nearly pushed the elves out of the Imperatoria continent, single-handedly. He looked towards Miller and Wolfred. I have high expectations. I hope that you do not disappoint. But Lord Commander. Commander Gladwine sat down clearly upset. I will tolerate no more protests. We still have more matters to discuss. The meeting proceeded for around another hour. There was further discussion about the positioning of the units and the plan for the offensive. Flametail walked out of the tent with Ron following closely behind. Still carrying that little kitten with you, Commander Flametail. Commander Grayers, a wolf beastman, greeted them with that. Flametail turned around and nodded with a neutral expression. Ron is a very good squire. Thank you, I'm not that surprised that humans are with you too. He laughed before continuing. Typical. The weak always flock to you cats. Ron started hissing. Ron stop. His hissing immediately stopped but his hostile stare didn't. Understood Madam Flametail. Madam Flametail this. Madam Flametail that. It seems so funny. Well, now if you will excuse me, I have some important matters to attend to. You cats can go laze around in the sun. In a tent, Ron voiced his complaints in a childlike manner. But mom, he was being a prick again. I know, Ron. But we can't be having fights amongst ourselves right before a major offensive. If it was any other day, I would have given him a good beating. Ron was still clearly upset. Flametail shook her head. He's just being jealous of our division's accomplishments. Now go get some rest. We will be marching into battle tomorrow. Ron nodded and walked off to his tent. His back felt very sore. He had been accidentally bumped off of the trucks multiple times. Miller asked Wolfred as they were walking towards their supply trucks. I'm not sure if I had heard that rhino correctly but they want us to be the vanguard. Seems like that Lord Commander guy is testing us. From the way this is planned. The only actual support we are getting in this battle for the first 30 minutes is from the 5th Division. Won't it also be bad for him if we lost? He's being cautious. All the other forces are far enough that they will be able to quickly retreat if we fail. We are just some mercenary unit. Of course, 
He doesn't trust us completely but he clearly has high hopes in us. We just gotta prove ourselves. What are we going to do about those elven tanks? I thought we were planning to use hit and run tactics. Wulfred pulled something out of the back of the truck. Why do you think I brought these then? Less than an hour later, Miller started setting up his tent when a commotion got his attention. Wulfred was arguing with a human knight. As he got closer, he saw the human knight was Commander Gladwine. I challenge you to a duel. I don't use a sword. He laughed. You don't have a sword. The elves don't have them either. And neither does the Imperials. And why do you think they don't have them? Swords are archaic weapons. I will give you a sword and we will. A booming voice disrupted Gladwine. What is happening here? Gladwine turned and immediately saluted. Lord Commander. Commander Gladwine. What are you doing? Sir, um, I just wanted to test the capabilities of these mercenaries. As they are a vital component of an operation that my men will participate in, I need to understand if they are qualified. There is no need for that. But sir. Darkhorn glared at Gladwine. Are you doubting the words of a superior officer? No sir. I will take my leave, sir. Gladwine scampered away as Darkhorn looked over at Wolfred. Sorry about that. He's a proud knight. It's fine. Wolfred knew that even Darkhorn had some doubts about the Diamond Wolf's capabilities. It was hypocritical of Darkhorn but Wolfred was still happy that he was giving them a chance to prove themselves. Afterward, Darkhorn departed as quickly as he had arrived. 1535 April 14th, 2020 CE, 0747 Sun 14th, 2020 CE, Elven Headquarters, Subakan Kingdom. Field Marshal Nyevan Ayana, commander of all elven forces on the Soana continent, studied the laid out map. The current line is finally stable. We can now restart the offensive. Their allied human kingdom, the Subakan Kingdom, had finally mobilized their entire army. Even though it only consisted of human knights who were much weaker when compared to the beastmen, with this vast boost in manpower, the elves were able to regroup their spread out forces without losing any territory. He laid out his plans to his subordinates. We will push through their center. When we cause that to collapse, the sides will give way. Having such a meager force, it was decided that it was best that they concentrated it into a heavy punch that could destabilize the technologically inferior enemy. 0825 April 15, 2020 CE. 0412 Sun 15, 2020 CE. Frontline. The Magipanzer engines roared to life. A division of them headed straight for the Soana League Army's center. Report? Surprise attack? Multiple groups of tanks are coming. Scouts from the Soana League had quickly come back when they sighted a large Magipanzer force headed straight towards them. The usual elven artillery fire and close air support that preceded attacks didn't appear so the Soana League was caught completely off guard. News of it spread quickly across the front line. The Diamond Wolves had moved out earlier in the morning to take up the position from where they will be starting the offensive. A somewhat worried member of the Diamond Wolves was talking with Wulfred. What do we do about this commander? We can't be expected to take on 100 tanks. We have never done this before. We are literally in the way of an armored spearhead. Wulfred shook his head. Well, it seems like the elves got a jump on us. Funny how we decided to go on an offensive at nearly the same time. Miller looked up from cleaning his gun. Well, we should be prepared for this. Depends on how large that tank force is. The scouts just said multiple groups of them. Any orders to pull out? Wulfred shook his head again. The Soans is trying to stop it. Seems like that rhino is pulling units from the flanks to reinforce us. If they punch through, the Soans is gonna have a major problem. I won't be surprised if they had invested everything into this defensive position. Well, I guess we are using a different weapon. The Carl Gustavs won't cut it. Wulfred stood up before talking again. We are moving out. The person who was talking to Wulfred earlier looked up. Where are we going? Can't stay on open ground when tanks are coming. We are going to a better position. The Soans instructed us not to move though. 
Miller laughed. He remembered that this guy was new. We are mercenaries. We don't have to follow orders. We are getting paid to kill and defeat the enemy and that's our objective. If the orders given don't help us accomplish what we are being paid for, then we don't need to heed them. More than an hour later, the first elven tank appeared from the horizon. It slowly got close and closer. Even more elven tanks appeared from out of the horizon. Like test these babies out. Fire. A tow missile slid out of a tow launcher. An hour earlier. 100,000 dollars a pop. Didn't put much of a dent to the gold we got from the Soans. Though these things are still expensive. We only got two of them launchers so we have to use them well. Should have the range to take out them tanks. You literally seem to be pulling these weapons out of thin air. Why don't I know that we bought these? What can I say, I love surprises. Miller sighed, he was getting a bit tired of his commander's recent shenanigans. Where did you even get this? Was this approved? I can understand the Carl Gustav getting through but tow missile launchers? Don't tell me you got these off some sort of black market. Had some connections. When you are in the mercenary business, it's important to have them. Back to the present. The forwardmost guard tank exploded. Where is it coming from? They are firing from somewhere hidden. Spread out and move forward. Another guard tank went up in flames. Wolfred laughed while looking down his binoculars. Ha, huh? look at them cook. They still haven't seen us. Pretty sure they are expecting some sort of massive anti-tank gun. Keep up the fire. I only see ten of them. Now they're spreading out. Well, that won't help much against guided missiles. A tow missile slammed into another one of the elf tanks. It went up in flames as the tank lurched forward before stopping. Diamond Wolves Interlude Part 2 0937 April 15, 2020 CE 0448 Sun 15, 2020 CE Kingdom of Albia, Soena Continent At once, the guards stopped their advance and started backing up at full speed. Another one blew up as a tow slammed into its turret. One of the tow operators laughed. Look at them go, they haven't even fired yet and they are running. Then, the guns on all of the guards flashed. A shell impacted close to their position and exploded. Another one was way off target. A couple flew right over them. The force from the overhead shells was easily felt by the mercenaries below. Everyone turned their heads to look at the operator who said that. I will. I will shut up. Miller watched as the elf tanks backed further and further away. They are out of range now. We got six of them, that's what I would call a job well down. Okay, boys. Time to pack up. We are moving. Wolfred dusted off his cargo pants as he got up. He watched as his men picked up the tow launcher. Careful with them. If any of you break it, it's coming out of your paycheck. I mean it seriously this time. And it ain't cheap. They walked back to the Humvees and trucks that had been parked further back. Miller caught up to Wolfred. Where should we go? Somewhere close by but not too close would be sensible. We are gonna keep ambushing them until they give up and go back home. A person came running up to them. Commander, there's a knight on a horse coming in our way. Wolfred nodded. Stay on guard. Wolfred shouted towards the incoming horseman. Stop. Identify yourself. The horseman stopped and reined his horse in. A messenger under the orders of Lord Commander Darkhorn? I have an important report to make to Commander Wolfred. You are speaking to him right now. The horseman got off his horse, walked to him, and saluted. Sir, multiple elven tanks have overrun positions of the 9th Division and 15th Division. Lord Commander has ordered your unit's retreat. You are in a dangerous position and under threat of encirclement. In addition, he has commanded your unit to reposition to help the 5th Division, they are currently engaging enemy infantry. Scouts have also reported that elven tanks are approaching their position. Got it. But what about the elven tanks that came through here? The messenger was alarmed. Elven tanks came through. Well, no, we beat them back 10 of them came and we destroyed 6 of them. The messenger blinked at Wolfred in surprise. You destroyed six of them. Yeah. Ah. Uh, I. I will report this, um, 
Where did you exactly destroy them? Can I take a look to confirm? Not too far from here. Wulfred pointed towards the back. Go over that hill and there should be a clearing with their destroyed tanks. Thank you, the knight saluted and rode off. Wulfred turned towards his men. Okay, boys, change of plans we are skedaddling. Seems like our friends in the 5th Division need our help. Elven Headquarters, Subakan Kingdom. Field Marshal Iona looked at the battle report in surprise. Our flanking force was defeated, only 4 out of the 10 guards survived. Some sort of anti-tank weapon is blocking the way. So the hands of those slimy Americans have even reached here. The field marshal spat out those words in disgust. The adjunct continued his report. Other than that setback, all other positions are not facing any difficulties. Categorize this as a small American unit that has come to support the kingdoms here. We will have to find a way to deal with it. Kingdom of Albia, so in a continent. The knight slowly trotted his horse up to the wreckages of the elf tanks. He stopped his horse and came down. He touched the twisted metal of one of the tanks. They actually killed six. Thirty minutes later, the sounds of gunfire echoed in the sky. Keep security. Bravo 1, please move up to scout the area. We should be coming up to a battlefield. I don't want any nasty surprises. Got it. Bravo 1 is moving ahead. One of the Humvees got out of the line of vehicles and moved up from the sides of the road. I don't see any tanks yet. Is the road clear? The 5th Division is defending it. The elves are firing from a sparsely wooded forest. We can drive up to them safely. You heard that boys. Go, go, go. The line of Humvees and trucks quickly word to life. Flametail had her back to a mound. I now see why they wanted us to use these guns. The 5th Division was holding extremely well against the attacking elven infantry. The AK-47S easily tore through the elves' lines. However, the elves were still returning fire. If they had been using swords against the elves, they wouldn't have stood a chance. Just then, she heard noises and looked up to see the Diamond Wolves' vehicles heading towards her division's position. They are using assault rifles. The elven infantry had been completely caught off guard when the beastmen started using guns. Their formation had been designed to counter the fast sword charges of the beastmen. This meant that they were bunched up together in multiple groups. They had been quickly gunned down when the beastmen opened fire. As the diamond wolves arrived at the battle, they were greeted with a bizarre scene. Beastmen from a fantasy world donning medieval era armor and firing modern weaponry. Fighting Nazi elves who had WW2 weaponry. It seemed like a real-life mash of Civilization VI and Total War, Warhammer II. The doors of the Humvees were slammed open as men jumped off of the back of the trucks that followed. They immediately set up positions in order to fire upon the elves. Wolfred popped up from the mound and fired his AK-47. Besides him, Beastman and his members were also firing. An occasional shot from the pinned-down elves would come but it usually missed. As the forest was not really that dense, it didn't provide much cover for the elves. The gunbattle battle raged for a while before the elves gave up and retreated. Flametail came up to greet Wolfred. Surprised to see you here. Got orders from your commander to assist you. There are tanks coming your way, speak of the devil. A rumbling noise came from the forest. Wolfred turned towards his men. Get the Carl Gustavs? Elven tanks are coming. They will be close to us this time. The first tank appeared a few minutes later. Wolfred shouted to the beastman. Keep clear of the back of the anti-tank weapon. The Carl Gustav operator then also shouted. Back blast. A massive puff of fire came out from the back and a round flew out and hit the first elf tank. The tank stopped and exploded. The beastmen have anti-tank weapons. The group of remaining nine Magipanzers instantly stopped their advance forwards. The Magipanzer in the lead had been destroyed. The commander of the Magipanzers made a quick decision. We will flank from the left. The five Carl Gustav operators looked around. I don't see any more movement. Was it only one tank? Wolfred got his binoculars out. There is trees blocking the way but I don't see anything. Stay on alert. I don't think there was only one tank. 
The one that just fired, reload, they could try to rush us so be prepared. A shout rang out. Tanks coming in from the left and right. They are trying to flank us. Tanks simultaneously came out of the forest from the left and right. Dirt was scattered into the sky as the elf tanks opened fire and hit the ground. The sound of machine gun fire began. Fire. Back blast. It wasn't long before the firing died down. Suffering some light casualties, the Diamond Wolves had successfully beaten back the elven armored assault. Elven Headquarters, Subakan Kingdom. Sir, we have broken through at the left flank but we failed to break through the right. The plan won't work under these circumstances. What do we do? Field Marshal Ayana hit the table with his fist. Damn it. This had ruined his entire plan. He wanted to encircle them and crush their center but that won't work now that only the right fell. He thought it over for a while. We will keep a defensive posture on our right and center. Tell the units on the left flank to continue their advance as planned. Divert the 3rd Guard Magi Panzer Company, the 19th Infantry Company, and the 36th Infantry Company all to the left flank. They will continue the push deeper into enemy territory. Right flank of the Soana lines. They had had some success while battling the elven infantry but it was short-lived as elven tanks soon showed up. The beastmen were unable to place their sticky bombs on the elven tanks as they were being heavily protected by their infantry. Commander Gladwine looked around at his dying men. He didn't want to give the order but understood that the battle was lost. Retreat. So in a headquarters, Kingdom of Albia. Report? The right flank has fallen. Lord Commander Darkhorn showed no emotion at those words. Internally, he cursed at the fact that the elves decided to start an offensive when he did. Left flank of the Soan lines. Before long, the 5th Division and the Diamond Wolves also received word of it. After a messenger gave them the current situation, new orders were issued. Lord Commander has ordered your unit to begin an assault. Your job is to make the elves have to pull units away from our right flank. Wolfred turned to Miller. Hmm. I have a better idea. We are splitting into two units. Your unit takes the tow launchers. We will be taking the Carl Gustavs. You are to set up a defensive position and halt the elven advance. I'm gonna attack as ordered to. Miller thought it over and nodded. Will do. The messenger looked quizaciously as Miller moved towards the vehicles and gathered his men. Um, sir? What are you doing? Wolfred explained to the messenger. The messenger immediately protested. This is against orders. Hmm? It's not against orders since you never specifically stated that my whole group has to attack. There was also no specific order preventing me from sending units to help the right flank. All I have to do is to attack the elves from this flank which is what I'm doing albeit with a smaller force. The messenger hesitated. But. He started to speak and trailed off since he didn't know how to respond. Wolfred nodded. Time is off the essence, we will be setting off. We will advance with you. Wolfred nodded at Flametail's offer. He understood that with the diamond wolves split in half, it would have been difficult to advance by themselves. Thirty minutes later, Wolfred drove his Humvee through the sparsely wooded forest. With him were a bunch of other Humvees and trucks. Up ahead were the 5th Division and the Diamond Wolves that had the Carl Gustavs. They had been advancing for a good while. Wolfred got on his radio. Dalton Rodriguez was the one commanding the Carl Gustav unit. There are probably still tanks in this forest. A few minutes later, there were sounds of explosions up ahead. They are taken care of. Probably the remnants of the ones that attacked us. Nearly an hour later, Rodriguez came through the radio again. We are seeing some elves. How much is there? Um, I think we found their main position. Okay, dismount. We are attacking. An elf sat there enjoying a talk with his friends. He was very glad that his company wasn't the one who had been ordered to attack. The elves from the infantry company that came back from their failed assault were in terrible shape. Enemy attack? Enemy attack. He looked up to the shouts and blacked out as a 7.62 x39mm bullet went through his head. Right flank of the Soana lines. Hurry, hurry. 
Commander Gladwine goaded his knights. The elves were hot on their trail. A tank appeared behind them. It stopped and started to turn its turret towards them. Disperse. The tank exploded. Miller smiled as the toe slammed into the tank behind the knights. Seems like we got here in the nick of time. We will stop them here. Don't let a single tank through. A few minutes later, Gladwine trotted his horse up to ones who saved the survivors of his unit. He recognized the man as one of the commanders of the mercenaries. Elven headquarters, Subakan Kingdom. Our attack on the left flank has stalled and the right flank is being pushed back. Field Marshal Iona sat down. Retreat and regroup. As the adjutant left, he could hear loud shouting behind him. This was all going so well, until those idiots attacking the human empire messed it up. Now I'm stuck here. Chapter 59 Looming Battle 1425 April 14, 2020 CE, Washington DC Time 1012 Sun 14, 2020 CE, Elven Nation Time 0825 April 14, 2020 CE, Hawaii Time A submarine of the Elven Attack Fleet, S-56 Captain, there's something approaching from our front at high speeds the captain looked over the UMWE's underwater monowave emitter operator's shoulder and watched as a blip moved closer and closer to the center. He had been warned about the fact that American weapons were a bit superior to the elves. Must be an American weapon of sorts. Probably an advanced torpedo. Dive, 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 evade it. The ballast tanks inside the submarine filled with water as the submarine started going deeper. The submarines behind them started turning left and right. It should pass right over now. The crew waited quietly. The blip on got closer and closer. Then the submarine shook. It hit us. Sounds of panic started. We are taking on water. The bottom compartments are all filling with water. Submarines behind the S-56. S-56 has been hit. The torpedo has come out the other side of S-56. It's changing directions and coming towards us sir. Get us to the surface? Being underwater isn't safe. Elven attack fleet flagship, NN Conqueror. Admiral, our submarines are under attack. Some sort of torpedo is going right through them. Admiral Adurm Vainery sat down with a beleaguered face. He had experienced the power of American weaponry and still had no strategy to completely deal with them. He said his next words without the commanding aura of his past self but that of a normal man in a regular conversation. Since we haven't been attacked yet, this weapon may only be capable of attacking submarines. Tell all submarines to surface. They are doing just that sir. Good. S-88. S-71 had been taken out. It's changing directions towards S-102. It's fast. S-102 has been taken out. It's changing directions again. It's targeting S-34. Why can't we rise faster? The captain of S-88 felt panic welling up in him as the single American torpedo destroyed one submarine after another. Come on. Come on. We are approaching the surface, Captain. NN Conqueror. Admiral Vainery questioned his staff. What's the situation? Eight submarines were taken out by what we classified as some sort of torpedo. What is this torpedo? It's not explosive but it's guided and goes straight through our submarines. Causes them to fill up with water from where the torpedo entered and exited. It's too dangerous to submerge. Tell all submarines to travel on the surface. What will they do during battle, sir? Admiral Vainery hesitated at that question. Submarines were made to be stealthy and attack from underwater. Now that they couldn't go underwater, they had lost their main advantage. I will find a way. Ocean near Hawaii. Two sailors on the USS Zumwalt were talking while doing their jobs. What the hell are the higher UPS even thinking? The main guns don't even work on this thing. Well, we still have our missiles. I heard that the elves have a hundred submarines. How in God's name are we gonna deal with that? I dunno how exactly but I do know we are still gonna beat the shit out of them. Besides, you're panicking far too early. The battle shouldn't actually happen until like 12 hours from now. 
1634 April 14, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 1034 April 14, 2020 CE, Hawaii time. The suburbs of Honolulu, Hawaii. Gary, seems like the neighbors are panicking. They are packing up and leaving. Honey, we will be fine. It's a bunch of World War II ships, but still, I'm a tad bit worried. Don't you think we should try to find a safer place? Maybe go closer inland at least. The words from the TV in the background caught their attention. The president will shortly be addressing the nation on the current situation. Honey, they are just overreacting. This isn't some Independence Day movie. Aliens aren't coming to obliterate us with a massive laser. Look I'm pretty sure the president is coming on to tell everybody to calm down. We were caught off guard and suffered severe losses. Now, we face a similar threat. However, history will not repeat again. We know that a large elven fleet is closing in on Hawaii. We know their exact location. We know what we are facing. The United States Navy, Air Force, and Air National Guard will confront and stop them soon. My fellow Americans, you have nothing to fear. Your safety is guaranteed. Hawaii is not under threat. People of Hawaii, do not panic. Place your trust in the armed forces of the United States. The enemy will not lay hands on American soil. I promise you that not a single enemy explosive will land on Hawaii. Thank you and may God bless America. 1823 April 14, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. White House. First engagement should occur within the next 12 hours, Mr. President. President Hayes nodded. How's the fleet that's going to clear the way for D-Day 2? It was decided to call the operation to invade the Elven homeland, D-Day 2 because it truly fit the situation. It also shed a good light on it. The purpose was to emphasize that this was a war to defeat a country with a similar ideology to the Nazis. Should be approaching soon. The operation has been set to commence about two weeks from now. Good. Good. What about the current ground situation in the Magus Imperium? How's our land forces? Everything should be completely secured now. We do have a problem with the prisoners though. Hmm. There's too much for us to handle. 50,000. President Hayes' demeanor changed at that number and whistled. Any solution? I was just about to ask you about this. We are thinking of handing most of them over to the Magasians. They seem well experienced at handling large numbers of prisoners taking into account their massive wars with the mock. They also seem quite willing to take them. Hayes knew that handing the elves over to the Magus would end pretty badly for the elves but not doing so would have caused problems in the future. And besides, he didn't really care for the elves. They weren't even human so there weren't any pesky rules of war that applied to them. Of course, he still wanted most of the rules of war to be followed in order to maintain a good public opinion. I suppose that's fine. Any news from the Green Berets we inserted? Nothing new since the last time I briefed you on them. They should either have arrived or gotten close to arriving in the elven capital. Ocean between the Soana continent and Magus Imperium. A large American fleet was sailing straight towards the elven homeland. Seaman James Murray was talking to his friend, Seaman Zach Stevens again. Why aren't we turning around then? Won't get there in time. And besides, I don't think a bunch of outdated ships are gonna do much. 0350 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 0455 Sun 15, 2020 CE, Elven Nation time. Afavalin, Elven Nation. Two elves walked into the hotel. Welcome, what are you boys here for? How much is the cost for a month's stay for both of us? A month you say? Hmm, let me calculate that. Give me a few seconds. The receptionist got out a piece of paper and did some calculations. That would be about 1 gold and 10 silvers for a one month stay. Okay, thank you. One of the elves fished out 1 gold and 10 silver notes and placed them on the counter. We have breakfast every morning. If you have any problems, come down to this desk and we will gladly fix it. The elves got into the room and shut the door behind them. They quickly took their ears off. Phew. Finally, 
These fake elf ears get very uncomfortable very fast. The other elf got out their radio. He spoke into it in a low voice. Is everyone in position? Over. Fairy 3 has already settled down. Over. This is Fairy 4. We just got there. Over. Yep for Fairy 2. Over. Fairy 5 is nearly there. Over. Fairy 6 is um somewhat lost. Um, we shouldn't be far from where we are supposed to be. Over. Good to hear. Just follow the plan. Out. They had decided to further split up the group into a total of six teams with two people in each. The original two team with six each wasn't optimal. Having such a large group of elven males coming into the capital city at once and staying at the same place was bound to raise suspicions. An hour later, Pablo and Dennis strolled through the streets of Afavalon. It was extremely lively, people crowded the streets and cars clogged the roads. Other than the noticeable lack of skyscrapers and the fact that everyone had pointy ears, it kind of felt like New York City. As they walked down the street, they spotted a building of interest. It was given a large space and had guards protecting it. Pablo nodded to Dennis. They separated. Dennis wandered around the street but purposefully and slowly got closer to the protected building. He walked right into one of the guards. What are you doing? Oops, sorry. I'm so sorry. Get out of here. Um, I'm completely lost. Where exactly am I? Are you blind? This is the home of our great leader. If you don't leave, I will shoot. Sorry. I'm leaving? Dennis turned his back and walked away quickly with a smirk on his face. 0350 April 15th, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 2150 April 14th, 2020 CE. Hawaii time. Honolulu, Hawaii. Deck of the USS Missouri. Whoever ordered this to be reactivated is a complete idiot. An engineer looked at one of the manuals for the USS Missouri. What the fuck is this part? Another engineer walked over and looked at it. Not sure. I guess it's saying that that's connected to that. Oh, reactivate one of the missile systems, they said. It should be easy, they said. Motherfuckers. This ship hasn't actually been maintained for 29 fucking years. Can't whoever is on top understand that. The generators are kaput. We won't fix them in time. We are gonna need to bring in our own if we want to get the missile systems running. How are they even gonna fire the fucking missiles? We have to replace the electric panels. 0712 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 0112 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii time. Miles away from Hawaii. On the USS John C. Stennis, 2F A18 Super Hornets got ready on the catapult. Chapter 60, Defense of Hawaii Part 1. 0714 April 15, 2020 CE, Washington DC time. 0114 April 15, 2020 CE, Hawaii time. Near Hawaii, 2F A18 Super Hornets launched from the USS John C. Stennis into the night sky. In a mere 30 seconds, another two were launched. Washington, D.C. seems to be some sort of show of force. It was clear from the satellite imagery that seemingly all the elven submarines of the fleet that was currently heading towards Hawaii have surfaced. President Hayes scratched his head at Curlson's words. Show of force? Show of force to who? They shouldn't know that we can see their ships. Maybe it's to boost their own morale. I fail to see how having all your submarines surface would boost morale. It seems like a stupid thing to do. Then I don't know what they are doing. Vice President Woggs got their attention. People, people, this isn't important. The Super Hornets will be in missile range soon. 0735 April 15, 2020 CE 0135 April 15, 2020 CE, somewhere in the Pacific. Four Super Hornet squadrons flew in formation. Let's waste these fuckers. They each had a full load of harpoon missiles. From the 44 aircraft, 176 harpoons were fired. They broke formation and began their return to the USS John C. Stennis. Washington, D.C. All missiles have been launched. 
President Hayes leaned back on his chair as he watched the screen that broadcasted the positions of the Elven fleet, the U.S. fleet, and the Super Hornet squadrons. We are going to need to procure a lot of new missiles or we are going to have a massive shortage soon. A few minutes later, Elven fleet. The sound of explosions echoed. Admiral Vainery grimly opened his eyes and looked at the metal ceiling of his room. So it has begun. A massive explosion occurred on the bottom left side of a small aircraft carrier as a harpoon missile struck it. Smoke billowed out before a massive explosion seemingly ruptured the aircraft carrier. The harpoon had struck its magazine compartments that had been filled with bombs and torpedoes. Another harpoon hit right on the bow of a massive battleship. It caused much less damage but there was a gaping hole where the harpoon hit. The Elven fleet did not stop advancing as one missile after another hit. Smoke billowed out of the superstructure of a cruiser where the missile hit. A destroyer, ripped in two by the explosion of a harpoon hitting it, started slowly descending into its watery grave. Its surviving elves jumping overboard. More and more ships were hit with each passing second. The night was lit with explosions and the fires coming from the ships. S101. Dive, dive, dive. The sound of explosions reverberated in the submarine. They were more willing to risk the threat of the torpedo attacking them than be obliterated by air attacks. The NN Victory has been sunk. The NN Zumler is taking on water. The crew says that they can keep it afloat. There was a minor magazine explosion on the NN Ilyana. Crews are working to take out the fire. The S-29 is gone. Reports of the damage came flooding in. In the end, 25 destroyers, two submarines, one light aircraft carrier, and three cruisers were sunk. Much more ships were damaged to varying degrees. Admiral Vainery viewed the damage from the bridge of his ship. Black smoke billowed into the sky as ships engulfed in fire sunk. Elves waved their arms and floated around the sinking wreckage. Rescue them as quickly as possible. We don't have time to idle. Understood. Before the officer could leave, Admiral Vainery stopped and turned around. Wait. Don't get me wrong. We are saving all of them. No one will be left behind. We just need to do it fast. Even amidst all this destruction by and without them knowing, they were still a bit lucky. Not all harpoon missiles reached their targets. Some of them just missed by chance while others accidentally targeted the submarines. Most of the submarines dived away just as the harpoons were about to hit. Washington, D.C. President Hayes stared at the screen as reports came in that the missiles had hit. The Elven fleet showed no change in direction. They are just recklessly charging us at this point. Although reports say that they have suffered high damage from the harpoon attacks, the Elven fleet seemed to show no signs of retreating or even a change of tactics. Albeit with fewer ships, the elves continued steaming forward. Krilson nodded. They are probably on a suicide mission. It's almost as if their commander gave up already. We are preparing for the second strike. Their ships should be moving into the missile range of our ships. They are getting awfully close to Hawaii. We have multiple Air National Guard fighter squadrons on standby there. They are ready to take to the air at a moment's notice. Why weren't they launched already to attack the Elven fleet? Most of the aircraft there are better suited to be or are just air superiority fighters. Some of them could be used for anti-ship purposes but we will only do that under dire circumstances. 0753 April 15, 2020 CE 0153 April 15, 2020 CE Elven Fleet Inside the officers' meeting room, the officers of the NN Conqueror gathered. Our scout planes have been out searching for the enemy fleet but we haven't found them yet. Admiral, shouldn't we try to redirect our course? We will be destroyed before we even reach our target. Admiral Vainery shook his head. Even if we did, we would still suffer the same amount of casualties. The Americans can reach us even if we split up into groups. Can't we employ the strategy we had used in our last battle? We were the ones defending while the Americans were the ones attacking. Now it's the opposite. Is there anything we can do, Admiral? Vainery pondered for a bit. Although he had already given up, his subordinates hadn't. At this moment, 
he decided to accompany them all the way. We will send the submarines ahead. But what about the torpedo that attacked yesterday? Our submarines have submerged and have yet to be attacked. I have no clear idea on how American weaponry really works but I believe that the Americans will attack when they can. The submarines should be safe for now. A few minutes later, everyone left the room after the strategy meeting concluded. Vainery sighed. Surrender was unthinkable to quite a lot of the officers, especially the younger ones. Vainery expected a full mutiny if he dared to entertain the idea of surrender. U.S. Fleet The Super Hornets started taking off once again. This time, harpoon missiles were being launched by the ships besides the USS John C. Stennis. White smoke trailed behind each missile as they headed for the sky. The trails of white smoke filled the sky as they curved towards their target. Missiles were being fired from Arleigh Burke destroyers, Ticonderoga cruisers, and Zumwalt destroyers. Washington, D.C. A report on a different situation came from Curlson. Seems like the Green Berets have found quite a few important locations. Curlson placed down a satellite map of a Fallon on the table. Marked in red XS were important civil and military buildings. They will all be targets in our first strike. President Hayes rubbed his eyes and stifled a yawn. He had woken up early so he could be there when the naval battle started. Now it has started to affect him. I guess it's a good time to call a meeting soon on finalizing the plans for D-Day 2. 0834 April 15, 2020 CE. 0234 April 15, 2020 CE. Elven Fleet. More explosions started occurring. The NN Zumler had already taken five hits to various places. Although with a limp, it was still moving. Even his own ship, the NN Conqueror was hit. It was by sheer luck that the explosion didn't reach any of the bombs or torpedoes that were stored. One battleship, one fleet carrier, one light carrier, three cruisers, and twenty destroyers were destroyed in this second attack. A Magi radio operator came up to Admiral Vainery. One of the scout planes has a report. We haven't found their fleet but we have found land. This could be their home base or maybe even their homeland. Admiral Vainery nodded. Launch all aircraft to attack? We can't let this opportunity slip away. One of the officers protested the decision. But Admiral, we will leave our ships without air cover. The enemy can attack us without even getting near us, our air cover is useless. We will just worthlessly waste our aircraft as the carriers get sunk one by one. Admiral Vainery was being extremely stern in his reply. The officer who had objected hung his head down. Understood, Admiral. All aircraft carriers of the fleet prepared to launch their aircraft. Pilots got into their planes. Bombs and torpedoes were quickly loaded on. On one of the light carriers, the NN Undefeatable, the propellers of their planes spun to life as the ground crew prepared them. Lights from the aircraft carrier lit the runway. A flag was waved and the blocks on the wheels of the aircraft were removed. The flag was then waved down and the first plane went down the runway. As the aircraft continued to launch, three explosions rocked the NN Zumler. Report? The battleship NN Zumler has been struck by an enemy attack again and is heavily damaged. The sounds of explosions reverberated in Vainery's room. Launch all aircraft as quickly as possible, speed it up. Although it took some time, it wasn't long before 147 EA-192N, naval modified, fighters, 162 RA-189N, naval modified, dive bombers, and 135 RA-1 torpedo bombers took to the sky in groups of large V formations. Deep in the sea, the submarines started passing the surface ships. Although they were told to advance ahead, the submarines weren't that fast so they were still right next to the Elven main fleet. Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, Honolulu, Hawaii. The alarms on the base rang loud and clear. Men quickly scattered onto the runway. 14 F-22 Raptors of the 199th Fighter Squadron, part of the Hawaii Air National Guard, taxied down the runway. 70 F-16A-BS and F-16C-DS of the 152nd Fighter Wing from the Arizona Air National Guard followed right behind. 
F-15C slash DS of the 114th Fighter Squadron from the Oregon Air National Guard were idling on the parking spaces. Aircraft from many other fighter squadrons were also there, although they were intended only for emergency use only against the elven ships, when the Navy couldn't keep the elves at bay, they were now being launched in response to the approaching elven aircraft. Elven Air Fleet the designated commander of the assemblage of planes got onto his Magi radio. The scout aircraft spotted multiple buildings and ships. Our mission is to destroy all of them. Dive bombers will approach in three waves. Torpedoes bombers will sink any and all ships that they come across. Fighters will provide cover in all circumstances. 0845 April 15, 2020 CE. 0245 April 15, 2020 CE, 199th Fighter Squadron. We got a horde of them. Weapons free. The bay doors in the center belly of the F-22 Raptors opened up. The other 13 F-22 Raptors followed suit.